Tiga, is Mrs. Nes Yulidia Nurprati WM Cup, the Honorable DPD Secretary in Miss is Mr. Nes Munawir Alfandi S. Cup, the Honorable DPK PPNI Secretary is Mrs. Nes Mila Sartika M. Cup, SP Cup MB, the Honorable DPK Pendidikan Bekasi District is Mr. Nes Angga Seful Rahmat M. Cup, SP Cup Com. The Honorable Mr. Jonathan James Ibanez Quiro, RNCNN from Philippines. Good morning, Mr. The Honorable Dr. Prof. Abdul, Prof. Dr. Abdul Ali Raja Muhammad ASA from Malaysia. Good morning, Mr. The Honorable Mr. Nes Muhammad Adam MKP SP KMB. The Honorable Mrs. Nes Rahmani Sakina SKP MKM as a moderator. The Honorable and beloved for all of participants today. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, let's say thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has given us guidance, happiness, healthy, and mercy so that we can attend by platform Zoom today and participate in this special event without any obstacles. Let me introduce myself. My name is Ingit Marlita. You can call me Ingit. It's a precious chance for me to be master of ceremony on this first very special occasion of International Nursing Webinar. I'm together with my friend, she's Mrs. Nes Rahmani Sakina Eskep MKM, where she's as moderator. She would like get of material presentation from our speaker. On this special event, we have several agendas as follows. First, listen to Indonesia Raya Song and Mas PPNI. Second, speech from DPK Pendidikan Bekasi District is Mr. Nes Angga Seful Rahmat MKP SPKP.com. And for the third main event, which is first presentation will be presented by Prof. Dr. Abdul Ali Raja Muhammad ASA from Malaysia with the title is Fluid and Electrolyte Management in Hypovolemic Shock from Malaysia. Second presentation will be presented by Mr. Jonathan James Ibanez Quirao RNCNN from Philippines with the title is Fluid and Electrolyte Management in Chronic Kidney Disease from Philippines. Third presentation will be presented by Mr. Nes Muhammad Adam MKP SPKMB from Indonesia with the title is Interpretation Blood Gas Analysis Henderson and Stewart Method from Indonesia. And for the last, our agenda is closing. Well, before we begin for our agenda of this event today, let's pray with each religion. Sebelum kita memulai acara pada hari ini, kita uh, berdoa menurut agama dan kepercayaan masing-masing. Pray, begin, berdoa dimulai. Finish. Well, let me to begin this event. Which is first agenda or first is listen to Indonesia Raya Song. For all participants, please to listen, listen to Indonesia Raya Song. <laughs>
Thanks to for all participants have listened to Indonesia Raya song. And for the second is listen to Mars PPNI. Please, for all participants, listen to Mars PPNI. <laughs> Kesatuan perawat nasional Indonesia Wujud ikatan profesi perawatan Tempat membina dan mengembangkan kemampuan diri Dalam membuktikan keberadaannya Mendapatlah dengan keyakinan lebih pasti Sejajar dalam hadirkan diri Bangkit berdiri dan langkahkan kakimu itu Menatap hari esok penuh asa Wahai perawat Indonesia bangkitlah dan majulah Untuk menolong sekalian yang menderita Kuatkanlah pribadimu, tingkatkan pengetahuan Untuk memberikan asuhan keperawatan Kita melangkah untuk mengisi pembangunan Bangsa negara Indonesia Untuk menghantarkan bangsa nuju sehat semua Dengan semangat jiwa Pancasila Maju perawat majulah dalam kancah pembangunan Tunjukkanlah pada sekalian orang Jadilah perawat model kesehatan bangsa kita Jadilah teladan dalam hidup sehat Bangkitlah perawat seluruh Indonesia Dalam mengembang Citra profesi menjunjung tinggi kode etik keperawatan, laksanakan panggilan tugas mulia, mencapai derajat kesehatan seoptimal mungkin bagi warga negara Indonesia. Sebagai bukti kiprahnya mahkota putih suci dalam mendukung pembangunan kesehatan. Dengan organisasi PPNI yang pokok Padu bersatu serta selaras Perawat Indonesia akan mampu angkat Citranya di mata insan dunia Thank you for all participants have listened to Mars PPNI. Next, for our agenda is main event, which is we can get new knowledge about fluid electrolyte imbalance and acid base management update in emergency cases from three speakers. We have two guest speakers. They are our some people. Wow. Let me introduce guest speaker. They are first presentation will be presented by Dr. Abdul Ali Raja Muhammad, ASA from Malaysia with the title is Fluid and Electrolyte Management in Hypovolemic Shock from Malaysia. Second. Well, then for the second presentation will be presented by Jonathan James Ibanesquero, RNCNN from Philippines, with the title is Fluid and Electrolyte Management in Chronic Kidney Disease from Philippines. So before we um, two main events, so we have speech from DPK Pendidikan Bekasi District from Mr. Nus Angga Sefo Rahmat MKEP Aspek Kepkom. So for Mr. Nus Angga Sefo Rahmat MKEP Aspek Kepkom is already. Okay, Bismillah. Yeah, gimana kabarnya Pak Angga hari ini? Alhamdulillah luar biasa. Alhamdulillah Herobil Alamin. Karena Pak Angga sudah siap. So, time is your Mr. Angga. Oke, okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah wal alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala asrofil anbiya wal mursalin Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. 
our honorable speaker, our honorable uh, committee, and all the uh, guests. It is with a great pleasure and honor that I will come you all to this distinguished international webinar uh, on a topic of utmost importance in the file of medical care. I'm here representing the chairman of DPK Pendidikan, PPNI Kabupaten Bekasi. This webinar held by DPK Pendidikan uh, involved three countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Philippines. In our ever involving medical landscape, staying current with the latest advance and update is crucial to providing the best care to our patient. This webinar holds particularly significant as it develops in, into two critical aspects of emergency medical care, fluid and electrical balance and acid-based management update in emergency cases and early warning score system in emergency cases for adult pediatric and obstetric patient. This equilibrium of fluid, of fluid and electricity, uh, electrolyte, within the human body is fundamental to sustain life in emergency uh, scenarios. Maintaining this balance become uh, even more challenging. Our distinguished speakers who are experts in this field will shed light on the latest strategies, techniques and breakthrough in managing fluid and um, uh, electrolyte imbalance and ensuring optimal acid-base equilibrium during critical moment. Furthermore, this, uh, this implementation of an effective early warning score system uh, in emergency care can make a substantial difference in patient outcome, whether we are dealing with adult, pediatric, or obstetric case. <clears throat> Having a reliability, a reliable system to assess and uh, pre uh, predict patient deteriorating in pro uh, paramount. Our speaker will share this insight and experience uh, it's utilizing such system to change the quality of care provided in these uh, diverse uh, scenarios. Uh, this international webinar has brought together healthcare professionals, researchers, and experts uh, from various corners of the world. This exchange of knowledge, ideas, and experience that will take place over the course of this uh, event hold uh, the potential to save the future of emergency medical care on a global scale. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to our uh, esteemed speaker for their dedication to advancing medical science and their willingness to share their expertise. Uh, I also extend my expression uh, appreciation to all participants who have taken the time to join us from different time zones and backgrounds uh, all over Indonesia or maybe in other country too. Before I conclude, I encourage all of you to activity engage, ask questions and participate in a discussion. Let us make the most of the platform to deepen our understanding and broaden our perspective. Once again, I welcome you all to this enlightening webinar. May the knowledge share here today ripples through our practice and contribute to better healthcare outcome worldwide. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much from uh, for Mr. Nes Angga Sevul Rahmat MKP LSPKPKOM from speech and opening for International Nursing International Webinar for the, today. Thank you so much, Mr. Angga. So, wow, it's wonderful from the speech from Mr. Angga Sefo Rahmat. Yeah, well, so after we have listened to a speech from DPK Pendidikan Bekasi District, it is from Mr. Nes Angga Seful Rahmat, MKP LSPKPKOM. So, we have continued for the main event so which is uh main event is for the two speakers first from malaysia and philippines yeah so they will be get by mrs nurse rahmani sakina escape mkm as a moderator 
So for the first presentation will be presented by Dr. Abdul Ali Raja Muhammad ASA from Malaysia the, with the title is Fluid and Electrolyte Management in Hypovolemic Shock from Malaysia. Then for the second presentation will be presented by Mr. Jonathan James Ibanez Quiral RNCNN from Philippines with the title is Fluid and Electrolyte Management in Chronic Kidney Disease. Yeah, so ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mrs. Nesrahmani Sakina Eskep MKM. Yeah, so she's already for the gate from Prof. Abdul Ali Raja Muhammad ASA and Mr. Jonathan James Ibanez Kera. Then, uh, Mom Rahmani Sakina, so you are already. Yes. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Time is your miss. Okay, thank you Miss Ingit for the time. Hello uh, Miss Mr. Angga, thank you so much. Uh, so, how are you everybody? Our audience in this seminar. Good morning everyone. I'm Rahmani Sakina. It is give me a great pleasure to be the moderator for our international seminar for our first day in Saturday, August 26, uh, 2023. So our topic is about fluid electrolyte imbalance and acid-based management update in emergency cases. I believe everyone is know, known already that uh, fluid and electrolyte imbalance is really one of important thing in our body. And the imbalance will get give a many and many cases especially in emergency cases so this topic is really important for us and ladies and gentlemen as we informed before we already have two speaker international from malaysian in philippine uh, we'll give our we'll give increase our knowledge about that before we started I will explain the role of this seminar. First, the speaker will explain for about 45 minutes. Following that, we will have a question and association for approximately 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Everyone can ask by chat. I'm sorry, we not open uh, the, the speaker, the speak curve uh, because yeah, maybe it will cause uh, many problem uh, it will also loud so you can just chat in chat chat room like that now we before we begin let me introduce our speaker our first speaker from malaysia wow this is near with our country isn't it and now our speaker uh, stay it in Indonesia, Dr. Abdul Ali Raja Muhammad ESA from Malaysia. Hello, Dr. Ali. This is his CV. He's head school of emergency medical service of science, head unit of emergency medicine, anesthesia, and critical care director, Masa Center. Planning Masa University. Wow, it's really good, isn't it? It's a really important person. Hello, Prof. Ali. How are you today? Alhamdulillah. Very good. Assalamualaikum. Alhamdulillah. So, Prof. Ali, now you stay in Indonesia? Yeah, we are actually in Malang, wow. in Java, Java wow. Timur sekarang. Uh, we are the Masa University team, including Vice Chancellor here. Yeah, we are signing an MOU with the close to about 25 uh, institutes of higher learning in Sydney. Uh, so it's a very nice place. Now, I'm still in the hotel, in the ski, it's the beautiful <laughs> paddy field. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful shadow field. You know, I love uh, yeah, this, uh. this place. Thank you so much. Okay, oh, finally you can get to Indonesia. Welcome, yeah. sir. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, now we will go to the main session for about a uh, lecture from Prof. Dr. Abdul Ali Raja bin Muhammad about fluid and electrolyte management in high flow volumic shock. Okay, Prof. Dr. Abdul Ali, time is yours. Thank you very much. Allow me to share. Yes. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, uh, uh, to start off, so shall we thank uh, Allah Ta'ala for all his excellence 
and order all the benefits that it has provided, including all the profits yeah, that we do on the lab. And thank you to all the uh, participants who are here, who have uh, taken all the effort you know, and uh, listening to this webinar. Yeah, it is important, as a Sunnah says, yeah, your place is in paradise. Yeah. And so the topic today is fluid and electrolyte management in hypo volume shock. You know, I'm from a city. We are the leaders in nursing. Yeah, we have got nursing program right down to PhD. Yeah, so to get right down to PhD, we have got paramedical training. We have got one of the best MBBS private training number one dental training in Malaysia. Yeah, so uh, we work to the excellent higher education. I was in 25 years from in University of Malaya. Yeah, this is one of the 59th in the world ranking. Yeah, so our learning objective, what is it today? Yeah, today is about identifying the etiology. What are the causes of hypovolemic shock? what hypovolemic shock really means, and then we'll touch upon treatment and management of it. And then of course, yeah, strategies, yeah, in trying to work as work together with a medical team on the managing the patient. Yeah, first thing we need to ask ourselves is, yeah, in what is the real problem? What is a real problem in uh, management? The major thing is they end up in ICU. Yeah, they end up in ICU because yeah, of the various complicated issues. And we ask ourselves, about why does a patient need to go to ICU? Yeah, then they found, yeah, I thought the ill and all that, then they found that 80%, 70 to 80% do not actually need to go to ICU. Because if we have been monitoring the history, the symptoms and signs, it has developed eight hours before the patient needs to go into ICU. See that, yeah? So if a patient says, or oh, you discover, patient got altered mental status, Eight hours before itself, the, pro the problem has already started. So we should be diagnosing that patient our, our scully, early itself before the patient becomes unconscious. Yeah? And that's what we are looking at now. Yeah? We are going to see yeah, how to go about at the end, how to go about yes, the early signs and all that. So number one is what is shock? Ada tiga perkara dalam ini. One, it is a complex clinical syndrome, number one. And yeah, this syndrome results yeah, when tissue oxygenation or nutrient in, is insufficient for the maintenance of the normal needs. Yeah, maintenance of the normal needs yeah, of the patient. Yeah? So, and with this problem, yeah, we need to know what is really happening? Yeah. So uh, we are going to see this. If you have to classify uh, uh, classify shock generally, I don't but yeah, one is hypovolemic, cardiogenic, obstructive, and distributive. Yeah, these are the four uh shocks yeah and we break down more to hypovolemic shock yeah this is yeah all the details yeah you have got this yeah this whole cardiogenic shock you now when you discuss this thing yeah these are the various causes symptoms yeah signs at the vital signs picture but right now we are going to look into this yeah hypovolemic shock according to hypovolemic shock, yeah? And we are going to look in great detail, yeah? So hypovolemic shock is due to secretary failure. What is a failure? Yeah, acute reduced effective intravascular volume from bleeding, yeah? 
from bleeding, blood tissue, yeah, contains bleeding of the uh, yeah, blood vessels. And then, of course, acute reduced, in, in fact, intravascular volume of the body fluids. So, kita ada dua perkara di sini. One is the blood tissue, loss of the blood tissue. The other is water in the electrolytes. Yeah. So, we are going to see this issue. Yeah. The, yeah. We know, yeah, standardly, yeah, the intake must be balanced into the output. Yeah, the oral intake, yeah, oral liquids, food, yeah, with the food and the metabolites, yeah, within the body and all that. At the end, we have urine about 1.5 liters, stools about 200 mils of water, and then when we breathe in and out, yeah, 300 mils, and then skin from your normal sweating, you lose about 600 mils. So totally, it's about 2.6, yeah, liters. Kita kena minum standardnya 2.6 liters, yeah, roughly 2.6 liters. What will happen, yeah, if this pressure is dropped, yeah, normally, yeah, standard where a normal state. As soon as the pressure is dropped, yeah, this is the juxta glomerular cells and tissues. Dear, yeah, straight away, yeah, it triggers. It triggers the renin angiotensin mechanism. And this ready angiotensin mechanism, yeah, the system has a vessel constriction as well as the aldosterone is produced, and there's a reabsorption. So it diverts to normal. The other uh, one is also, yeah, from the yeah, the the baroreceptors. Yeah, the baroreceptors, yeah, in the blood vessels of that, it is sympathetic. Initially, there's a vessel constriction. And the third process is, yeah, the osmoreceptors in the brain. Yeah, they've got thalamus as well as the, yeah, posterior pituitary. Yeah, there's ADH is reduced. Yeah, and you have this water retention. And of course, you feel thirst from the thalamus and then ketamino. So this is how it's constantly, yeah, it is managed. Yeah, and along with that, electrolytes move in and out. The normal cell, potassium is inside, sodium is outside, and there's a constant balance. So you must check when you're checking the electrolyte balance, most importantly, sodium, potassium, Calcium, magnesium for normal thing. Yeah, the this, yeah, this bicarbonate and all that, yeah, they will balance by itself. Yeah, but the most important is sodium and potassium. Yeah. So these are things yeah, you, you need to check. Yeah. So what is hypovolemic shock yang kita bilang? Yes, just now, yeah, is one loss of blood and loss of fluid, which includes, yeah plasma and fluid itself. So you can see loss of blood can be internal or external due to trauma, yeah? And of course, internal, yeah, can be hematoma, hemoperitoneum, hemothorax, yeah, bleed inside, can be melina, yeah? Can bleed in the stomach, and of course, external can be trauma, can be GI tract it itself, yeah, postpartum hemorrhage, yeah, act of pregnancy, yeah, it can be uh, uh, vomiting blood or coughing out blood, hemoptysis, hematomasis, yeah, these are all the ways that yeah, blood can get lost. Loss of plasma usually burns, yeah, commonly burns. And then, of course, if you've got, yeah, dermatitis, a dermatitis, lot of plasma will be loose, yeah, inside from the various, yeah, the skin lesions. Then loss of fluid, external loss, you get uh, vomiting, diarrhea, excessive sweating, diabetic acidosis, internal loss, pancreatitis, ascites, yeah, and the intestinal obstruction. So, yeah, these are the ways in which it can loss, yeah. So, gastrointestinal loss, yeah, remember, yeah, we produce almost about six liters, yeah, inside the stomach. Yeah, from the yeah, 1.5 liters, yeah, in the saliva, we have got gastric juices, 1.5 liters, liver, pancreatic juices, about two liters, and then intestinal secretions, about two. You can see, yeah, close to about seven liters, actually, yeah, they are produced inside the stomach and reabsorbed. 
reabsorbed quickly. Yeah, and you get about yeah, at the end with the feces about two hundred mils. Two hundred. Yeah. yeah, but the problem is if it gets obstructed. Yeah, if it gets once it gets obstructed, the yeah the mana mana yeah this yeah for the cecum the whole fluid will collect, and it's a loss to the circulation. It's a complete loss to the circulation because the circulation is a closed system can yeah so intractable vomiting diarrhea yeah bowel obstruction yeah all this will go oh if we've got the fistula. Yeah, uh, fistula, the, yeah, the, actually cancer patients can. Yeah, they will have fistula, stoma, and so on. Yeah, yeah uh, they can lose the fluid from there. So these are the common gastrointestinal losses. Yeah, and then of course, heat stroke, sweating. Yeah, uh, often, yeah, they will have this sweat and it causes DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, very common. Yeah, acute gastroenteritis, especially in children. Yeah, acute gastroenteritis, especially in children, they lose a lot of fluid. And then, of course, yeah, ascites, cancer of the liver, la, cirrhosis of the liver, la, but you can get yeah, this kind of ascites, which is lost. Renal loss, yeah, renal loss can be loss of salt, as well as the fluid, yeah, due to DKA. For example, and then of course, if you've got some, yeah, loose, yeah, salt, yeah, wasting, yeah, diseases, yeah, which is, yeah, that common, yeah, which you can see. Skin loss, as mentioned just now, yeah, patient can lose close to about two liters, yeah, and that's why we say heat stroke. Because once he loses, yeah, the 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 uh, about two liters, yeah, one point five to two liters, he will go into shock, yeah, and uh, yeah, and the sign, yeah, at the duogenes, one is heat exhaustion, the other is heat stroke, yeah, heat stroke when actually he becomes unconscious. Yeah, unconscious. You complain of yeah, throat headache, nausea, vomiting. Yeah, and then of course, yeah, you will have your yeah, very rapid pulse. Whereas in uh, most of our cases are heat exhaustion, excess sweating. So you will have kill clammy, uh, yeah, and they'll get cramps, but not stroke. Stroke is when they become unconscious, altered mental status, and the BP will go down. That's when we say the patient has got stroke. Yeah, as mentioned, there are various third spaces, yeah, and can be intestinal obstruction, can be ascites, can be pleural effusion, or it can be burns like this, yeah, especially, yeah, second degree burns, as well as a third degree burns, yeah, or chemical burns. Yeah, chemical burns. Yeah, in our site is as well as a heart failure, heart failure, you'll have this kind of loss. So you can see, yeah, the losses can be in various ways. And of course, in bleeding, number one is could be, yeah, due to ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Yeah, ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Yeah, suddenly, yeah, it's abnormal pregnancy, especially in the tubes. It can rupture, yeah, and you will have, yeah, bleeding into the peritoneum. Yeah, you can see the fluid level, yeah, diagnosed by ultrasound, and the patient will have a shock picture. Yeah, so these are things you can play more than manage a patient. But trauma management is something quite different, yeah, and very common. Yeah, very common. Why is it very common in uh, yeah, in our part of the world? Like for example, Malaysia. Yeah, the, we have got one of the highest accident rate. Indonesia actually it is close to the the yeah in 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 this part of the world. In fact, the world study shows uh, Malaysia is one of the highest. Yeah, Indonesia is about the first ten. Seven, eight, or nine, ten. Yeah, where you have this yeah you know, trauma and hemorrhagic problem. So how did they bleed? One is evisceration. Yeah, like this, or it can be stab wound, can be gunshot, or most of the cases, yeah, trauma accidents. Yeah, you can see seat belts. Yeah, in the young, in the abdomen, you can see yeah uh, distended. Yeah, this is in the retropatinal space, and then you've got the seat belt. Yeah, and you can see the abdomen is distended. So these are all bleedings within. Yeah, as well as 
these various types of wounds, hemorrhage wounds. You have a chum knee. This is okay. This is about 500 mils only the patient will lose. Crush injury, 500 mils, patient will lose. Yeah, but what the patient will go into shock is machamni, where it will bleed into the cavity and the patient will come to you with hypovolemic shock and we call that as hemorrhagic shock. Yeah, so blood loss, yeah, is one of the yeah, chief problems, yeah, bleeding into the spaces, yeah, outside as well as into the abdomen. So, hurting your blood loss, yeah, what do you understand by blood loss? Yeah, so we know, yeah, if it's got a 70 kg, yeah, patient, we have got about five liters calculated at seven mils per kg body weight. Itula. Yeah, our contents. Yeah, it's not like five liters, everybody tired. Yeah, if you've got, yeah, a patient is 50 kg, 50 times seven, three and all. So its blood volume will be 3.5 liters. Yeah, that's how we want to discuss here. Yeah? But yeah, if you see the whole body, you've got 42 liters. Yeah, in the whole body. Yeah. Okay. And then, yeah, you've got, yeah, 12 liters, uh, 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 30 over liters are in the interstitial space. And then you've got about 12 liters, yeah, in the interstitial space, interstitial outside the cell. Yeah, and then I've got five liters inside the, yeah, in the uh, intravascular space. So if the patient were to bleed, so obviously, if he's bleeding, they're sure there'll be signs and symptoms. Yeah, especially if it is, yeah, parietal bleed, PV bleed, or hematosis, hemoptysis, or into the chest cavity, into the abdomen, into the pelvis, or the thighs. Yeah, these are where the places patient can get massive blood loss. So if there is a massive blood loss, yeah, you call it hypovolemic shock, yeah, is potentially life threatening condition. How? What are these things happen? So yeah, there's a rapid loss in intravascular volume at the end, yeah, the hemodynamic instability. Therefore, there'll be decrease in oxygen delivery to the tissues. Therefore, the tissues will have decreased perfusion. Therefore, the enzymatic changes, all that will get damaged. Then immediately patient will go into cellular hypoxia. That cellular hypoxia will cause organ damage. And then you can get multi, yeah, uh, dysfunction syndrome, MOTS, yeah, multi-organ failure, and that will lead to death. Yeah, so this is a process in which your patients can die. Yeah, in hemorrhagic shock, they can die in one hour. Yeah, in vomiting and diarrhea, it can take about two to three days. Yeah, so these are the ways in which, yeah, so the patients will develop into, into shock. Therefore, we have got to be very alert. Yeah. Why do they die? Why at the end, what do they have? Yeah, they have severe hyperperfusion, body goes into acidosis, yeah, exposure, they become hypothermia, and then because of blood is lost, yeah, they can go into coagulopathy. And these three, yeah, these three are dangerous. That's why they call it as a little triad of hemorrhage actually yeah so that's what we want so once you say blood loss arcadia actually loses yeah you can see yeah hemorrhage yeah loss of oxygen carrying capacity carbon dioxide removal mountain immunity response ability to mount inflammation waste yeah hydrogen ion removal is reduced fluid and plasma protein is lost oncotic yeah as well as motic, yeah maintenance is lost he loses a lot of the coagulation factors uh, this is where the patient goes into divc yeah for example, yeah, in, in hemorrhage classically, yeah, in, for example, in, uh, in dengue fever, yeah, where they, the quadrifact tracts go haywire, electrolyte imbalance, sodium, potassium will, yeah, they are also lost. Therefore, the healing property is lost. The temperature control is also lost. Nutrition, vitamins are lost, hormones, minerals, this all carry in the blood, yeah, nutrient, vitamins, hormones, minerals, all these are in the blood. All will be lost. At the end, you lose 
energy. Tengok dia tu. Ya, so in that way, it is a serious problem. Yeah, therefore we have got to be alert. Alert to what? The signs and symptoms. Yeah, so as the patient loses the blood, yeah, these are the various signs and symptoms the patient will develop. Compensatory stage, yeah, wherein, yeah, first thing is the veins will become less full. The will become, yeah, vasoconstricted. Yeah, the one test that you normally I teach a medical students is this test. Yeah, you can see, yeah, the filling pressure in the veins. Yeah, if you tap on any vein, the filling pressure will be reduced. Therefore, because there's a general vasoconstriction, therefore, you'll get a delayed capillary feel, low volume pulse, pallor, yeah, as well as yeah, increased pulse rate, definitely. Once the increased pulse rate blood, because it's reducing the oxygen carrying capacity, the respiratory rate bone, yeah, will go up. Yeah, and there's vasoconstriction, intense vasoconstriction, yeah, peripheral vasoconstriction, the resistance night goes up. Therefore, the diastole will go up. Diastole won't go down. Yeah, the diastole will go up. The systole is the same, narrow pulse pressure. Once the patient loses more than 35, then systole tablita hand to systole also goes down. So you get that low blood pressure. Once a low blood group, the pressure goes, then the brain, most important organ, becomes confused, becomes agitated, becomes restless, combative, and then they will get stupor. Stupor, or thing, yeah? yeah, deep pain only he can realize. And then it will go into coma, sorry, yeah? Coma, C-O-M-A, yeah, coma. And then, of course, yeah, by that time, there'll be reduced urine output. You'll complain of thirst, thirst, thirst. Yeah, and then you become pala, pala, bradycardia, bradypnea, gasping, and death. So, yeah, all this scenario for hemorrhage, yeah, they have already got a classification, class one, class two, class three, and class four, yeah, including the, the vital signs. So it is important now, you should know this classification. So when you see the signs, yeah, quickly, you know, class two, class three, class four. Scenario. So once you class four, yeah, you can yeah correlate the signs and symptoms yeah to this yeah class yeah especially in class two and three sunang the 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 butcher patient there too because he will have low volume pulse yeah tachycardia yeah he will have pallor he will have decreased capillary feel that chukopda that means the patient has got at least about thirty percent blood loss that's what you must see first. Not wait for the BP to go down and become uncontrolled. Say, hey, your patient that So you need to detect that patient early. Ah, that is important. We want to detect the patient early before the BP crashes. Because if the BP crashes, as you see here, it might be too late. Yeah, so you need to see these signs, okay, confused, agitated, restless. These are the early signs. Yang kena, jangan, yang tunggu sampai patient bradycardia lah, cold and clammy lah, itu dah lewat dah. Yeah, so these are the early signs. Yeah, we want you to check. Yeah, how to check? Yeah, you can see, yeah, the objective signs, yeah, early warning signs, yeah. Uh, this is what we are checking, the objective vital signs. That's why we say vital sign. Kind of vital sign to adalah measurement. Measurement kadang patient to. And then there are all these subjective signs. Sunken eyes. Look at the oral cavity, dry, moist, thirst, skin, go, yeah, capillary feel, other tearing, all these are all the, and chapter of science is regarding calcium, hypocalcemia, yeah? So these are the signs that you are looking for, which needs good nursing care. The doctor alone bukan tengok ni, nursing care, because you are with the patient all the time. Doctor datang keluar, datang keluar saja. Unless it's a houseman, like, then they do do this too. They can say, but you are the what the pillar to the hospital. 
the child love you know think you are the pillar therefore you must yeah be monitoring yeah ni soba and then you also will monitor important urine output bukan tak yeah every morning you check the urine uh, input and then output you calculate i fluids you calculate the input berapa banyak dia dah minum dah you calculate and then the output why because of this we want to know whether he is losing or not then of course yeah the various data yeah when you have the yeah when you send the blood yeah uh, you must nurses doctors will come and see all these things and all that but very important is this too calcium jaran dia tu calcium sodium you must as soon as the results come you must check potassium berapa nya normal we know 3.5 to 5.5 once you go to 6.5 he is going to get arrhythmia already yeah sodium normal is yeah 135 to 145 once a patient goes to 125 ah da 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 tabli because why he is going to have seizure anytime he is going to have seizure so these are things that you will want to assess yeah and you have got to monitor that patient so management hemorrhagic shock is yeah we look to management like hemorrhagic shock we keep the equal atls system like advanced life trabot system where the primary survey is the what primary survey looking to have a control cervical so spine breathing ventricular control circulation hemorrhage control ini yang mustah sekali and then uh, this thing is in trauma situations yeah so circulation we'll see hemorrhagic shock yeah this is a hemorrhagic shock you can apply into povertile or uh, vaginal hemorrhage postpartum hemorrhage ataupun yeah perrectal hemorrhage ataupun hematomesis hemoptysis so what do you do number one, you put 214 gid line yeah in your tax physics yeah poison formula yeah, yeah so 214 gid line quickly take fbc bus yeah like sugar group and crotch with sanitol and then of course for abdomen you can do a fast scan like especially ectopic pregnancy can immediately get an ultrasound easy only now yeah abdomen will be distended rigid tender guarding yeah you'll be able to check they shall be pale because you're monitoring the vital signs remember yeah jangan tunggu sampai bp saja rendah see all this will go up yeah pulse rate yeah the respiratory rate yeah spo2 yeah all the spo2 will go down gcs will have altered yeah so you must monitor the trends do a jump to look macam mana yeah sekarang macam mana you must follow the trends if it is hammering somewhere you need to stop yeah trauma you immediately you stop senang saja direct pressure dressing senang saja jangan tunggu sampai doktor datang tu direct pressure dressing dah good yeah and then of course you can give yeah massive more than 3 liter sekara uh, sorry may more than 30% we can give iv tract sedic acid therapy gram yeah because that will stop internally yeah and then of course you with the fluid you choose is sodium lactate yeah sodium lactate and then colloids and all that yeah so you have got this there are three products yeah that you can give yeah blood products red blood cells platelet ffp crap respiratory as well has fresh rose plasma and gets about yeah uh, uh, as well has uh, yeah, the, the 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 plasma itself yeah so blood products then crystalloids which you have normal cell line like registered thing only crystalloid is normal cell line and registered book and 5% dextrose yeah 5% dextrose is not crystalloid it is just a glucose solution glucose with the this thing because by definition crystalloid means he has got crystal sodium salt dalam tu so normal saline ring us like that yeah crystalloid colloid ada albumin dextran yeah starch gelatin yeah dextran kita jarang guna sekarang yeah jarang guna sekarang starch yeah sekarang icu the guna yeah heta starch yeah hemex cell kan gelatin gelafundin gelafusin yeah uh, this is commonly used lah kerana dia tu uh, murah sikit ini mahal sikit yeah albumin uh, susah nak dapat lah it causes a lot actually but you still need to use if 
indicated. So normal this thing is a yeah, normal cell line, 0 0.n normal cell line, the ring is like 10. Yeah. So you want to choose this. So hemorrhage, yeah, there's other ways in investigation. Doctors will do endoscopy, surgery, radiology, and then but our role is to uh, run the fluids. But yeah, a combination of plasma platelets, yeah, and pack cells. Yeah, this for hemorrhage, yeah, trexidemic acid, So what are the types of blood? You get full crotch blood. This is for you to write for defer like later, yeah. You got full breast blood, type O, RB positive, unmatched type, yeah. Auto transfusion, massive hemorrhage. Yeah, importantly is administered early. Yeah, many times we administer too late when it's plus four hemorrhage. You must administer once 30% blood loss means he has lost 30% oxygen carrying capacity. Yeah, it's a musa. Therefore, 30% blood loss, you can you need to start giving the blood already. Yeah. So yeah, so diagnosing, you can do fast scan, a top on CT scan. Yeah, unto have if the patient is stable, right? So you can do this. Yeah. So this is a uh, yeah. Once you are giving that the same, yeah, to know whether patient got rapid response, so if you got an IV fluid for IV fluid, eh, not blood, eh, IV fluid, we challenge there. Skarang Sananda, you use 20 meals for children, 20, 30 meals for adults. You calculate per kg body weight. So if you get a 70 kg patient, 30 times 70, 2. Point, uh, 2 liters, yeah, 2.2110, uh, 2, yeah, so yeah, 30 times 70, yeah, so you can give 2 liters freely, I mean, provided they are the urine output, the vital signs, you see the early signs too, you can give. Yeah, calculate in that challenge. So we challenge your fluids. Macam dulu kita transfers, 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 penuh, 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 then patient gets overload. Kita tak, tidak nak tu. Tidak nak tu. We want to, yeah, challenge the patient's needs. Yeah, so, yeah, but if you have given it to, yeah, in children 20 mils per kg, 30 mils per kg, if it's not improving, then you know, yeah, minimal response, that means, yeah, patient has got to go to OT, lah, yeah, to control the hemorrhage. So these are the, yeah, responses that you look out for. So always, yeah, this class one, class two hemorrhage, yeah, this is where we are concerned of. Class two and class three hemorrhage, yeah, we if you look after a patient really well, you can save the patient early. But once it goes to class 4 hemorrhage, paya, susi. So always try to detect that patient early. So remember, fluid of, uh, recycle avoidance, hypertension are important principles. Yeah. And of course, in penetrating wound, yeah, be careful, balanced approach, challenge your fluids. Yeah. That's why we call that has controlled resuscitation or balanced recession, or hypotension recession, or permissive re hypotension. Yeah. Ini lah di empat nama mereka guna, ya, untuk, ya, sekarang terguna control resuscitation. No, I saw patient run, 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 run the fluids, and then overload tighter. Kita control resuscitation. Challenge in children, 20 mils per kg. In adults, 30 mils per kg. And we challenge. Yeah, I do get their improvement. Yeah, if a patient's got class two, class three hemorrhage, yeah, more than 30% loss, early blood transfusion. Itulah, yeah, kita punya, yeah, standard way of managing things yang kita sebut do sini. So, yeah, so, guys, we have a shock. We are going over again. Yeah, blood loss can be hemorrhage, plasma, loss of fluids. Loss of fluids can be can be severe vomiting, excessive sweating, diabetic ketoacidosis, as well as this one will be very slow. This will be fast. In two about three days, you can develop this. Then it is, yeah, this will take, yeah, ascites, liver failure, yeah, the hemorrhage, yeah. Acute hemorrhage, yeah, you'll be obviously be able to see all these problems. Yeah, so in non-hemorrhagic shock, yeah, tadi kita bilang to 30 mils per kg body weight. Yeah, and monitor, 
important. Monitor upper, heart rate, urine output, blood pressure, mental status, and listen to the base of the lungs. Yeah, base of the lungs. Yeah, yeah. so you don't you do not want to hear crepitations. Once you've got crepitations, that means it's a fluid overload. Stop. All you got to do is stop. It's over here. And you can give a little bit of life shot, tapi just stop the fluid, then the patient body will recover by itself. Yeah. So yeah, in the ICU, yeah, you can do CVP monitoring. Plus fracture here, passive leg rash, yeah, all this you can do, yeah, in the ICU setting. So crystalloids, this is for you to read later, yeah. I'm sure you will have access to all these notes. You can read later the yeah, ice cream advantages in what yeah of colloids, yeah, colloids. Yeah, one of the problem is some of these yeah products we can have allergy. That's why we have we are trying to stop using colloids. Color, no other choice. Yes, starch is best. Lah. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, normal saline, ringers lactate. These are the ideal solutions. Yeah. Lactate uh, solution. This is recommended now. Yeah. For most trauma as well as children. Yeah. This is what is recommended now. Lactate. Yeah. Ringers. Yeah. Solution. Yeah. So, crystalloids. Yeah. This. Yeah. I'm repeating again so that you will be betul betul fahamnya. Yeah, now the management. We just cannot do look it, just open. Yeah, bagi lah empat liter, semua liter, and then wait for patient to know that is current. We challenge. That's why we call that as a fluid challenge. Yeah, the guy, you see, always monitor the sodium, potassium, yeah, and yeah, and blood as ABG, lah, blood gases, yeah, that we discuss. Sodium, potassium, yeah, very important. Always watch the trends. Remember, yeah, that's why the baseline, yeah, is important. Patient must be improving. If there's a decreasing or worsening, you must detect early. That is why we have got this early warning sign star. Correct. Yeah, you can see. So this is the latest chart, like, which is used in Australia, New Zealand, UK, and all that. Latest monitoring chart, macam ni lah dia nya. Yeah, so you've got this color coded. Yeah, color coded. Let's say uh, obstetric. We get the get the blaja eso. Get the thing into. Yeah, early warning sign. This is what you are going to monitor. Yeah. So now we see it is a science. Get the jaga dia betul betul tiap tiap jam. Yeah. Then, of course, yeah, you can have a situation where patient is collapsed. Yeah, he is unconscious, no response. Then you call that as a pulseless electrical activity. That means, yeah, on the ECG, you see, hey, got PQRS rhythm, tapi no pulse. Got PQRS rhythm, tapi no pulse. Ah, then you know this is a PEA. Immediately, you must, yeah, commonly, this is what happens in hypervolumic shock, this 5H and 5T, yeah, in each chart, you can download, actually, you go to Google's, yeah, CPR guidelines 2020, other chart, dalam images, yeah, you can download this, senang aja, print it out, yeah, and you will have, the, this is the world standard sekarang for managing resuscitation. Yeah, go to the CPR, AHA, CPR guidelines. You have this chart, yeah, for a uh, collapsed patient. What is the high quality CPR kita kata? No more CPR, eh? kita kata high quality CPR. Macam mana cara kita nak resuscitate? And then, of course, here you got the, yeah, in a collapsed patient, yeah, then you have got this PEA management, yeah? So, overall management of shock, yeah, non-trauma, yeah? So you get a good history, macam tadi kita bilang, yeah? Check it out, clinical examination, of course, yeah, airway, breathing, circulation approach. Kalau dia tu collapse, yeah? CVAG, he comes collapse, then you got to do a CAD, yeah? Oxygen, IV excess, yeah? 214G, IV excess in the adults, lah. Chapsana for FBC, bio sugar, lactates, yeah, coagulation screen, blood, group and cross match, monitor the vital signs, jaga day to, yeah, check the urine output, do a toxic ECG, check the blood gases, yeah, and then of course, IV crystalloid. This is what you need to start with and monitor challenge, yeah? Yeah, 20, 30 mils per kg. Yeah, challenge the tray, tray, 
KG, yeah? K B C here. Yeah? Sorry. Yeah. So yeah, go ultrasound, CT scan. This you can, yeah, you can use to this. Yeah, manage, uh, monitor, uh, the, uh, investigate that patient. Yeah, you can do laparotomy, and of course, antidote, and of course, don't forget about antibiotics. Yeah, and manage the patient. Yeah. So how do you know whether resuscitation is adequate? Number one is urine output. Watch out. Clinically in the ward, patient must get good adequate urine output. Upper deer in, in adults, 0 0.5 to 1 ml per kg per hour. Don't say 35 mils per oh, mercy can add up 1.5 liter. Tidak. Tidak macam tu. We need to calculate, know the weight of the patient, and then 0 0.5 to 1 ml per kg per hour. So you're monitoring the patient hourly. In children, it is one to two meals per kg per hour. Yeah, in children. Yeah. So, so this is how you resuscitate. Watch out for this. Yeah, whether it's a metabolic acidosis, do not worry in a in a hypovolemic. Do not use sodium bicarbonate to metabolic acidosis in a hypovolemic shock. Need to underline that. Once you resuscitate the adequate fluids, once he has got the urine output. So you are managing the patient adequately. Okay. Yeah. So so these are the various ways. What are the complications? Yeah. Yeah. You can have circulatory overload or child compartment syndrome. Yeah. And this is yeah. You are giving too much, especially in a hammered patient in the operation and all that. It may this problem. Of course, if you are using blood. Transfusion rate problems. It can be complicated surgery, color, rawatanya surgery, radiology, complication of that. But remember, early bleeding source control and effective early goal directed volume resuscitation has improved outcomes for the hemorrhagic type. Yeah, hemorrhagic, or even in yeah, in 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 fluid loss due to AGE, acute gastroenteritis, at the open, yeah, from DKA. Yeah, so you use a uh, what do you call yeah the yeah, goal directed yeah challenging yeah resist resuscitation fluid. Okay, yeah, so it's important. Yeah, so the nursing care plan for hypovolemic shock. Yeah, and this is yeah there. You can download this in the in the Google yeah images here too yeah so you, you can see it tells about how to nursing assessment nursing diagnosis upper debole what is your objective and then nursing prevention how do you monitor what was about you monitor Michami yeah so this is a nice chart here yeah, which you can read yeah later okay yeah so with that yeah we are. Start to stop and remember this, yeah. Remember, yeah, sebagai seorang perawat, yeah, issue bukan patient saja. Kita bagi rawatan, issues bukan patient. Tapi remember, Allah Taala dia dimaktubkan in surah, yeah, al fusilat, yeah, ayat empat puluh dua tiga. Whoever does righteous good deed, it is for your own self. You see that, and of course, if you save that patient, yeah. You have saved mankind. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. So this is our objective. Yeah. Tugas yang murnia kita is to be able to save as many lives as possible. Thank you very much. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Salam alaikum. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, Prof. Ali, it's really good Thank information. You. And with the closing, Thank you. very nice. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Now we time in question and session answer. Okay, there is a question from Angia. Mm. I want to ask about fluid challenge. How can I ask? Just <laughs> okay. you want to ask? Uh, I'm so sorry, Humaira. Uh, we cannot open this uh, chat. Uh, the speaker mode, yeah. So the regulation is uh, asked from chat Zoom, isn't it, Mrs. Ingrid? Miss Angie, who? Uh, yes, I'm Nina. 
Yes, yeah, so Mrs. Sumaira, if you want to ask a question, you can write down in Chachu. What is your question? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, is there any question? We still have a lot of time. We still have about 20 minutes, uh, around 20. Oh, 20 minutes. I was too fast. Eh? No, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> but it's really clear, sir. Okay, good. Early. good. Okay, yes. Dr. Ahmad Fatoni. What do you want to ask? Um, okay. Because this is really important, isn't it? Profali about fluid and yeah. imbalance. Yeah, it is, uh, it is ah. essential because mm -hmm. we are in the world, we are monitoring it. So for, yeah, it's appropriate that we should be yeah, looking at it uh, in a whole way. Patient, uh, there's one question, I think, Muhammad Arif Sugiato. Yeah. Patient dengan batasan uh, you know, ratu uh, jam tetap dia loading jika shock uh, uh, patient dengan apa tu batasannya oh yeah wait 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 uh, I'm Pasien reading this from Arif umum. okay 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 the question from Muhammad Arif Sugiarto yes a patient with the minimum I am um, uh, I restrict, restrict fluid maybe uh -huh. cc for 24 okay. hours uh -huh. uh, when the patient in hypovolemic shock should be also given fluid like that. So maybe uh, the patient in condition, like maybe patient with CKD, maybe I think. Yeah, kidney, uh, if the patient yeah, has a kidney with disease, CKD, yeah, if the chronic, patient has got uh, a kidney yeah, renal problem, so, kidney problem, yeah. the first thing is we need to know why he's gone into shock. Shock bukan karena he has lost fluid. It can be overloaded. Mm. Yeah, one, it might be overloaded. One is an electrolyte uh, problem. It's a potassium problem. Yeah, so we need to check the cause of his condition. Yeah, and then, of course, yeah, whether dengan batasan, so if he's got a minimum of 600, yeah, CCC's mm. ability, uh, then if he's gone into shock, then you have got to, yeah, obviously challenge. Because once he goes into shock, that means the body cannot maintain itself so quickly. You need to resuscitate. Yes, so yes, yes. challenge, uh, challenge. The first challenge is important. So if the patient is say, yeah, real failure, say he is sixty kilos. Yeah, the first challenge is yeah, thirty meals per kg again. Yeah, so it's one point yeah, one point eight liters. Yeah, mm. so start the fluid, run the fluid at eight point eight liters, and then. Check whether the urine output is adequate or not. Okay. That is why it must be an hourly, hourly by hour by hour assessment. Hour and hour, okay. Hour by hour assessment. Uh, yeah, so of... although it says minimum 600, quickly, and it's a patient is a shock, quickly check what are the causes. Is it potassium okay? Is it sodium okay? Is the ECG is okay? Then, of course, is the lungs okay? Yeah, if the lungs is crepitous, you know, and full of crepitus and with some shock, is a yeah, traffic ECG. Quickly do a traffic ECG. Has he got a cardiac arrest? Has he got yeah, uh, a rather infarct ischemia? So all these causes need to be yeah sorted out. Yeah, and then of course, if you know that you might be over uh, or the, the underload, then you need to challenge the patients uh, with the thirty meals per kg. Hmm. Okay, but you've got to do that hourly, hour by hour. Monitoring, our, uh, monitoring, yes. close yeah. monitoring. Yeah. So in maybe fact, the most, first thing. Now, now if hmm. it is a shock, especially renal patient, every 15 minutes. Every 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah, it has got to be. Yeah, you've got to be monitored well. Hmm. About CKD, for uh, we will talk more deeply yeah, there'll be more, in the, yeah. our second yeah. yes, in our yeah. second kidney specialist uh, will be able to yeah yeah uh, talk but about maybe it, yeah. yeah so yeah. so the point of view from Doctor Abdul Ali is when the patient need resuscitation mm -hmm. when is emergency Check case, first, is what is the cost what yeah, yeah. Uh, what is the cost remember the five H and five T's. 
yeah the five h five t's is that is it loss of volume yeah is that yeah uh, the uh, hypothermia is it hypokalemia yeah hyperkalemia is it hypoglycemia hyperglycemia yeah, yeah? and yeah. then of course you see uh, uh, has he got uh, yeah, a uh, hypoxia uh, these are things that uh, yeah we need to sort that out mm. once it's sorted out yeah then you know exactly which is the appropriate treatment mm. okay yeah. so this five yeah. in, so it's really important we check which yes. one the causes yes. of the patient causes yes yeah yeah no point running that fluid yeah and then you have not managed the cause mm. the cooling yeah, is not going to improve in any way yeah Mm. So first of all, yeah. you must know what is the cause. Okay, yes. this is uh maybe for the doctor Ahmad Potoni. You we will talk about that again deeply in the second session. And this from yeah. Humaira. How much fluid change I can give to the patient with hypovolemic, but the patient are the same, but the patient has chronic kidney disease. Actually, okay, we'll yeah. So that how much? Was, uh, yes, time? yeah. But issue is. Quickly, you must know the cause. That's the um, more important thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is not. Yeah, what I have discussed here is without any comorbid factors. Okay. Yeah? But in a renal failure it. patient, you need to know the cause of the thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, Ms. Sumaira, we will talk more deeply in the second session. And then this is a question from Umaira again. How should I choose the fluid? Start from the crystalloid or colloid? The first fluid that you want to check, it's a good question, yeah? How do I want to check? Is depending upon yeah, whether it's a trauma or non trauma. Yeah. So, but the first this thing is you start with the yeah, sodium chloride. If you want to choose sodium chloride or sodium lactate. Yeah. Yeah, sodium chloride, sodium, sodium lactate, meaning ringers, lactate, Hartman's. Yeah, so you can choose one of that. Yes, yeah. Why they choose the lactate solution? Because it's a bit of balanced. Some don't agree with it. So you can choose either normal saline or sodium lactate. Like ATLS, yeah, and as well as a pediatric neonatal, they, they cut the, use a sodium lactate as your first choice of fluid. Yeah, some group they want sodium. So choose one, yeah, and challenge that fluid. Then, yeah, the first challenge is not enough. Then you know, say it's a hemorrhage shock, then you need to get blood, lah. Yeah, if it's more than 30% blood. Color blood suicide apart about too late, then you can add a colloid. Okay, you're running the fluids. You put a second line, yeah, and run a colloid yeah how much of colloid colloid can be given at 200 200 200 mils challenge yeah but your base this thing is you're running the yeah sodium lactate yeah or sodium chloride solution 0 0.9 n yeah yeah and then of course the second you set the colloid to assist so in this combination you're adding a colloid so that they'll be retained a bit longer remember Colloid works by oncotic pressure, and you have a longer the same. Okay, yeah. So that's how you want to give that. But once you've chosen this, yeah, you the the the, the, the sodium chloride, yeah, it's given at that thirty mils per kg challenge. Yes. Children, twenty mils per kg challenge. Yeah, and once you are challenging this fluid, always simplest is urine output. If the patient's ICU, yeah, you've got all the monitors, central venous pressure, all this you can manage. But in the ward, your your main thing is this, yeah, urine output. Is she getting urine output or not? The question is okay. from Ms. Sumaira, how about if the urine output is zero in 24 hours? Uh, if it is zero in 24 hours, then you have got to find out search. Yeah, yeah maybe yeah, maybe what is the dialysis. <laughs> yeah, uh, then, then you, you because of potassium is there, then you need to go into dialysis and all that. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, so if if it is zero in 24 hours, probably patient is under. So you need to challenge it still. Yeah. 
patient is yeah it is just like yeah the patient is in spite of the challenge if it is zero then is a renal acute renal shutdown yeah and that's a problem that's one of the yeah major problem is there an acute renal shutdown if once is an acute renal shutdown there is no urine upward but patient have crepitations then you are overloading now you know that the kidney is shut down immediately serum urea serum creatinine check that out yeah then yeah you know that you are causing a overload already that means it's an acute renal failure Hmm. Yeah, you can have an acute tubular necrosis. Yeah, you can have an acute uh, the same. Then, yeah, then your your game is a bit challenged, changed already. Yeah, now you've got a patient with the acute yeah renal failure. Now you've got to guard the same. Then, then immediately you've got to start on inotropes. Yeah, it often yes. happens even in sepsis. Mm. Yes. Very important start on, thing, even yeah, yes. Inotropes, yeah, yeah. Start on inotropes, yeah, yeah, especially, like yeah, sepsis, yeah. Uh, you need to have noradrenaline, yeah, and adrenaline or adrenaline. Okay. yeah, not adrenaline is best now for sepsis, okay. like, yeah, for for non septic. No, you can start on dopamine, dopamine, okay, yeah. when yeah. static, yeah. given dopamine, yes. okay, yes. Uh, is this satisfied? For the equation, Mrs. Humaira, if you, if you still have... Oh, I'm sorry, my display name before is wrong. The correct name is Angia. Okay, Angia, thank She said, so I can get an anatropic start from dopamine. Yes. Yes. You can give this... Uh, yes, yes. uh In IV line, isn't it? Yes. Huh? Mm. Okay. Yes, it is. Yes. yes, that's right. Okay, from... Dr. Ahmad Fatoni, in the assessment, we find compass, the compass, composition and the composition and irreversible. How to manage men and how to intervention the situation of that? You see, the, uh, once there's a compensatory state, yeah, you got the signs and symptoms scan, yeah, and then once you, you've got to start your management. You see, yeah, let me show you this compensatory state, yeah? Yeah. So you've got this, you see, yeah, the compensatory stage. Yeah, you can see this is a compensatory. But once you have started the treatment, the patient will improve. You see, simple as it. Yeah, this is your, yeah, this, uh, for example, okay. Yeah, so you can see the patient is a class two, class three, whatever hemorrhage, yeah. So once the class two, yeah, the compensatory, yeah, stage starts from here. So as soon as you start your management effectively, yeah, if it is, yeah, blood loss, then start the patient on half uh, the, yeah, start the patient on blood. Yeah, and then of course you are giving sodium lactate or uh, or renal solution, and then once you challenge your fluids, then all this will come down. You're already managing. Same thing here also, but here uh, then it becomes a problem. If it's an irreversible shock, then mortality is very high. Yeah, that means it's too late already. Yeah, so now if patient is here in irreversible shock, then you need to yeah quickly start massive resuscitation, ventilation, oxygenation, as well as inotropes. Yeah, start the patient inotropes here and check whether the patient improves as he goes or not. Yeah, but once you have started this early, then there should be any problem. Monitor the urine output, monitor the ABG, monitor the electrolytes regularly. Mm. Okay? okay. So that's how, yeah, that's how, how yeah, that, that's what whole resuscitation is about. Yeah, once we have, yeah, resuscitated in that way, uh, then sometimes surgery, it is all the time we find why the patient in a ward. Yeah, goes into collapse is because we have failed to detect the patient early. Yeah, 
This is the major problem in many, many hospitals. That is why in 2012 itself, in UK, they said all hospitals, government hospitals, including private hospitals, must use the early warning signs. So that once the early warning signs, it tells you low risk, medium risk, and high risk. Once it's in medium risk itself, you already jaga jaga already. You already dah mula yang rawatannya. Jangan tunggu sampai he goes into worse. Then you are going to have, yeah, you, you're preventing the patient from collapsing already. Okay? Okay. Yeah. So is it clear? Always, normally what I tell my medical students is, you go to Google, yeah, images, yeah, you type early warning signs, they are the chart, they are keluar dah. Yeah, you can... <laughs> Yeah, now I tell them you photo straight the chart color coded and make it into a yeah, hang around the neck. Yeah, the, the, yeah, print it out and then laminate it and hang around. Immediately on and off, you can check what score they dapat, patient dapat. Now, from the score, you know these are low risk, medium risk, and high risk. Yeah, yes. uh, so I uh, chart. Yes. We will uh, start. We will learn about EVS tomorrow, yes. so it will be correlation with today. Yes. Yeah, isn't it? So we will know what the situation patient and how we should do. Okay. Yes. So, uh, so this dopamine is a good one to start. Yeah, but don't start dopamine. You've not given fluids. Don't start. Is that good? Yeah, you fluid. need to challenge your fluids first. Given because uh, it's a hypervolemic shock, say from CDA AGE, the BP say is 80. Jangan mulakan inotrope dulu kerana the volume is not okay and you oh, it's still, it's still empty, still... tak cukupnya. Okay. Yeah, so you need to give him the fluids and okay. then add in the inotrope slow doses. Mm. So uh, the first one is... Yeah, yeah, go and better yeah. recover. Yeah. yeah, if you're not giving eye fluids, just yeah, give dopamine taguna. No, 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 no use. No use. It's not going to recover. Yeah, so you must always yes yeah, sort out the cause. Okay. okay. So hopefully it's really clear. Well, this is Ingrid and eh, Angita, yeah. Umaira, yeah. Angira, Angia. She said in her name is Angia, and okay. then. Uh, with Muhammad, okay, Sir Muhammad Arif, and also Dr. Ahmad Fatoni. Is there any question more, ladies and gentlemen? We still have uh, around five minutes more. I'm sorry because the setting is this for the large uh, participant, and it's a little difficult to change to given the audience. Time to speak because must be become a panelist like that. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, is there any questions more? We still have five minutes. Or maybe you want to give uh, more information, doctor, or a closing statement? Mm. Uh, sure. See, one of the problems in the what I find, yeah, many times, yeah, because sometimes you can have huge number of patients, can yeah, in the ward, yeah, generally the ward is made for about 20 to uh, average 24 patients, like right, in the ward. But sometimes in the ward, if you've got a yeah, large amount of patients, so it's good, yeah, I, I recommend everyone to have this early white sign document. Yeah, uh, I find that, yeah, it's so good for nurses as well as housemen in training. Straight away, you know, this is a high risk, medium risk or low risk. Every vital sign you check, 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 check. Okay, this is a low risk patient. You no, know, that you do not have to too worry too much. Once you say it's a medium risk from the history, yeah, and the vital sign is a medium risk, then you need to watch out. Tell the, all the team members, look, watch out, this is a medium risk, and start the treatment. Treatment can start it slowly and then challenge. Then once you do that, the patient will not go into a high risk. Hmm. See that? Yeah. Uh, if a patient comes to you already with a high risk, then aggressively manage a patient so that he will not go into collapse. Yeah. So, what is the management? 
simple, yeah, you got a baseline, yeah, a baseline, electrolytes, um, urea, sugars, and all that, you got a baseline. You know all the comorbid factors, you already know already. Now, yeah, you know the, from the vital signs, yeah, how much that you need to give, yeah? So in pediatrics, it's a little bit more difficult. You've got to calculate half normal la, you know, and that sort of thing. Whereas in the adults, it's much more easier. You just challenge with 30 mils per kg body weight. Yeah. And once you challenge it, and after immediately after challenge, Dangan Gyakantaja, monitor the patient for the next one to two hours. Then you'll see whether the patient is stabilized. And then, of course, in the meantime, you must treat the cause. Yeah, has he got intensive obstruction? Has he got search for the cause? That must be in while managing, you must also search quickly for the various causes of yeah, this hypervolemic shock that is from the history as well as from the assessment. Yeah, da tau da. Okay. Yeah, assessment. Yeah, uh, assessment. I've already yeah said here yeah, all the various assessment techniques yeah for the patient yeah that comes to you yeah uh, these are the various assessment techniques uh, in India. Yeah, so these are the all the uh, assessment techniques. Yeah, the electrolytes. Yeah, uh, the, the the next slide. Yeah, all, all the yeah the lab results. Yeah, these are the clinical assessment, subjective. Yeah, as well as yeah objective. This will you see from the vital signs. This one you can ask a patient. Patient intense this. One you give intense this. Once you give five hundred mils of fluid to drink. Yeah, not immediately within the next one to two hours, then you'll start changing already. The water will change. The urine output will be better. So this too needs to be monitored, your clinical assessment. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, yeah, yeah. Uh, Prof. Ali. Thank it's really you. clear. I think everybody is happy because this is a really great information. So, ladies and gentlemen, as uh, Prof. Ali said, we need to give uh, what is massive, aggressive treatment for hypovolemic subpatient because maybe in one hour we will get the patient's diet. And it's is our responsibility to give the uh, the good treatment for the patients as uh, yes as one of the no uh, no, no no we don't we we don't give massive anymore you know yeah we challenge the uh, yeah uh, we yeah. challenge yeah after it's a cutter uh, uh, challenge the needs yeah what you call that has the uh, for resuscitation. Yes. Yeah, we this three words. Yeah, that is used. Yeah, see that control, control the resuscitation. resuscitation. Uh, that's what we do. Or balance the resuscitation. These are the two words normally used. Like when you say control resuscitation, balance resuscitation. Uh, what it means is we are challenging that patient's needs. Eh? In children, twenty mils per kg. In adults, thirty mils per kg. Okay. Uh, no more massive resuscitation. We don't use yeah a measure. We say controlled resuscitation, balanced resuscitation. Okay, thank okay. you so much, Prof. Ali. Really great information for you. Okay, okay, see you again tomorrow with our yeah, topic that we already yeah. discussed be uh, slightly before. Okay. Okay. <laughs> thank you so thank much, you sir. Much. See you thank tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Have a you. nice day. Yeah, same to you. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, give a big plus for Prof. Ali. Wow, it's really great information. Okay, now uh ladies and gentlemen we will go to our second session because it's 9 30 already and we already have our best speaker one of our best speaker also from philippine there is sir jonathan james quiro rncnn wow i think everybody is waiting for him because... so how are you jonathan yeah how are you sir jonathan 
Hello everyone. Hello Dr. Ali. I'm great. Very good. Ah, my great. Ah, he's you see in Jonathan. His... Jonathan, you're becoming handsome. Handsome ah. I see. <laughs> Thank you so much. He uh, has already Hello Dr. Ali. Uh, how many yes. children do we have, sir? No. Sorry, how, what? How, how old your children uh, your your daughter? He's a very young father. Yes, yeah, from the look itself, you can see. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now we are going to the second session about fluid and electrolyte management in kidney, chronic kidney disease. Now, I think uh, everybody is really waiting for this moment because there is already question and answer about that. And we will uh, talking deeply here today in the second session. First of all, I will read the CV of Sir Jonathan James Quiro, RNCNN. His education background is a Jewish Doctor College of Law. Wow, you're interested in law, law isn't it? Experience yes, right. in Philippine nursing license examination, medical surgical nursing review lectures from Roxas City, Philippines. This is his email. He is also uh, one of Hamidale's staff nurse. In until now, isn't it, sir? Uh, no, ma'am, Nina. Oh no, no, no more. Okay, but he is also Doctor Carl Balita Review Center Medical Surgical Nursing Review Lecture. So he is really expert in giving lecture about this uh, our topic. Okay, maybe time is yours, Doctor. Doctor, Doctor, I will call you Sir James. <laughs> okay, time so is let me yours. share my screen. Okay, okay, can close the Ingrid, bisa ditutup. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as before, we will for the. We will give you about 45 minutes to explain about fluid and electrolyte management, and we will give an, an association about 15 minutes. Sir. Okay, Ma'am Nina. Are my slides visible? Can you see my slides? Yes, it's really clear. Thank you so much. Really okay. wonderful, colorful. So today I will be discussing fluid and electrolyte management. So specifically... Uh, fluid and electrolyte imbalances and its management in chronic kidney disease. So later on, I will be discussing the normal function of the kidneys. Because if you know the normal function of an organ, if the, that organ will have a problem or damage, we will know the manifestation. If we already know the manifestation, we will have our nursing diagnosis or nursing problem, then we will have our planning, then intervention. That is what we call the nursing process or the mnemonic is ADPI. So ADPI is very important also in your emergency warning system or scoring to be discussed tomorrow. So later on, I will be always discussing the function of the kidney. Why is it that the potassium is increased? Why is it that the fluid is increased? So again, what is kidney failure? Basically, kidney failure is when the kidneys are unable to remove metabolic wastes such as your BUN and creatinine and perform its regulatory function such as excretion of your potassium, phosphorus, and your production of erythropoietin, and etc. So in discussing the functions of the kidney, let's talk about one of your nursing diagnosis, which is hypervolemia. So again, one of the major functions of your kidney is basically urine formation and excretion. Your kidney produces your urine and your kidney releases or excretes urine from your body. But because of kidney failure, because of kidney failure, kidney damage, the kidney cannot excrete urine from the body. Hence, it can lead to what? Fluid volume overload. There will be what? Accumulation of fluid in the body. That is why the nursing diagnosis shall be what? Fluid volume excess or that is what we call hypervolemia or accumulation of fluid in the body. So as a point of view of a nurse, what will be our nursing consideration? What will be our nursing management? Number one, fluid restriction. Number two, we are going to introduce or to going to administer diuretics. So there are two types of diuretics. 
We have here potassium wasting diuretics such as your loop diuretic fluid your loop diuretic such as your flu flu uh flu uh yes loop diuretics you have your osmotic diuretics also then you have your potassium sparing diuretics such as your sat what is that you have your spironolactone aldactone amiloride and you have your triamterene it depends what type of diuretics are you going to give in patients with kidney failure, it depends. That is why you should check first the underlying cause or you should check first what? The electrolytes of the patient. If the electrolytes of the patient is high in potassium, then give potassium wasting diuretics such as your loop diuretics. Okay? If the potassium is low, give your potassium sparing di diuretics. And number three, number three is very important, no? That is monitoring of weight. Because one of the management of hypervolemia or accumulation of fluid in the body in your kidney failure is hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. So the functions of dialysis basically is to remove the waste products and to remove the excess fluid that is accumulated in the patient. Okay, That is why it is very important to monitor the weight before and after the dialysis. Why is it that we need to monitor the weight before performing dialysis to know how much fluid are we going to remove from the patient because if there is excess removal of fluid from the patient it can lead to what fluid volume deficit or your hypovolemia the can lead to hypovolemic shock that is very important to monitor the weight of the patient to know how much fluid are we going to remove from the patient monitor vital signs basically that is baseline vital vital signs especially the blood pressure because we cannot perform hemodialysis if the blood pressure is low because in the the mechanism of dialysis is basically removing the fluid or removing the blood from the patient going to the dialyzer then the dialyzer as your artificial kidney it will remove the excess fluid and excess waste products in the body so the fact that the blood is removed from the patient can lead to what Hypovolemia. So that is why monitoring of vital signs, especially blood pressure, is very important. So in, re in relation to hypervolemia, right? Hypervolemia or accumulation of fluid no, in the blood vessel. So because of hypervolemia or increased fluid in the blood vessel, it can lead to what? It can lead to your hyper hypertension. Hypertension or increase in BP. If hypertension is the problem, the goal should be what? The goal is to decrease the blood pressure. So if the problem is increased BP, the goal is to decrease blood pressure. That is why we are going to give what? We are going to give your anti-hypertensive medications. So the mnemonic, what are you going to remember? The mnemonic is A, B, C, D. So what is A? One of your anti-hypertensive medications such as your adjutensin converting enzyme inhibitors or ACE, also as your ARBs or your adjutensin receptor blockers. Then you have your B, you have your beta-2 adrenergic blockers or antagonist. You have your C for calcium channel blockers and letter D. In order to release fluid to decrease the blood pressure, you are going to give your diuretics. And very important, in your kidney failure is dialysis. Always remember, if the patient is having either acute or chronic renal failure, the management of choice is hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. That is the management of choice. That is the management of choice. That is the gold standard. So again, another nursing considerations is what? Because of the accumulation of fluid in the body, the extra fluid or the excess fluid can what? It can shift to your interstitial space. So there is fluid shifting from intravascular compartment going to interstitial compartment. A good example of your interstitial compartment is your what? Peritoneal cavity. So because of the excess fluid in the body, the fluid can leak going to your interstitial space or your peritoneal cavity. There will be accumulation of fluid in the peritoneal cavity that can cause your big tummy which is defined as your what? Ascites.
No, also in your liver problem because of portal vein hypertension, there is also leaky leakage of fluid from intravascular going to interstitial space. So in relation to your kidney failure, also additional information in your liver problem, one of the management of choice is the removal of fluid in the peritoneal cavity that is your paracentesis, that is paracentesis or removal of fluid in the peritoneal cavity. But because of paracentesis, please, as your nursing consideration, check for peritonitis. Because peritonitis is very fatal that can lead to what? Sepsis. Okay, that can lead to your sepsis. One of the classic manifestations of peritonitis here in the Philippines, especially in the board examination, in order for in, uh, in order for a student nurse to become a registered nurse, is what? The classic manifestation is your rigid, board-like abdomen, and you have your severe, sharp pain. You have your rigid, board-like abdomen and severe, sharp pain. Then number eight, monitor, x-ray, and auscultate the lungs. Why? Again, because of the excess fluid in the body, there will be what? Fluid shifting. So because of the excess fluid, the fluid can radiate, the fluid can go to your what? pulmonary or respiratory system. So that is why we should monitor the x-ray to determine whether or not there is fluid in the lungs. Okay? And auscultate. Okay? If there is no available x-ray or, or the time is very important, we need, uh, we need uh, a result or we need data immediately to perform intervention, auscultate the lungs. So if there is fluid in the lungs, you will hear what the classic manifestation of crackles and wheezing in the lungs. So that is a good sign that there is fluid in the lungs. Then also check for your ECG. Why is it to check ECG? Again, because of the accumulation of fluid in the body because the, one of the normal functions or important functions of the kidney is it produces urine and it excretes urine. But because of kidney failure, you cannot do that. You cannot excrete urine. That is why there is fluid volume excess in the body. So because of the fluid volume excess, there will be what? There will be shifting of fluid going to your cardiovascular system. That is why you will have what? The classic manifestation of hypertension. By the way, always remember, in your chronic kidney failure or acute kidney failure, the number one cause of death in the patients with Kidney failure is what? Cardiovascular diseases such as your what? Hypertension. Again, the number one cause of death if the patient is having kidney failure is cardiovascular disorders or such as hypertension. So that is why check for or monitor for your ECG changes. And also monitor for your central venous pressure. When we say central venous pressure, that is what? The pressure you are measuring the pressure from the right side of the heart. Why is it we are measuring the pressure at the right side of the, of the heart? Because unoxygenated blood all over our body will enter the right side of the heart, especially the superior and inferior vena cava. So in this case, the nursing diagnosis is fluid volume excess or hypervolemia. So what is the definition again of central venous pressure? Determining the pressure at the right side of the heart. So basically, if there is hypervolemia, then there is increased CVP because there is increase, there is what? Uh, there is large amount of blood going to the heart. That is why in K patients with hypervolemia, not only in your kidney failure, but also in the patient is unable to urinate or the patient is having liver problem, pancreatic problem, and etc. There is what? Increase in your central venous pressure. Opposite of that, if there is hypovolemia again, hypovolemia or dehydration or hemorrhagic shock, the CVP result will be low. Okay? And monitor for jugular vein hypertension or jugular vein distension. This is very important as nurses. Because as nurses, we have what we call clinical eye. So if we know that there is enlarged neck veins, there is already an indication that there is what? Fluid volume accumulation or fluid volume overload, fluid intoxication or hypervolemia or circulatory overload. That is what we call circulatory overload. 
question, how do we monitor jugular vein hypertension? You should elevate head of the bed, elevate head of the bed 30 degrees. That is basically your low Fowler's position. So if you're going to put the patient in, Low Fowler's position, if you cannot see low Fowler's position, the answer should be what? Head of the bed elevated 30 degrees or in some books, it is 45 degrees. Then there will be what? Increased pressure in the neck veins that can lead to enlargement of your neck veins. So in relation to your hypertension, what are the new guidelines in hypertension? Because as we know, one of the one of the most common complication or the most common cause of death in CKT patients is what? Hypertension or cardiovascular diseases. No? So number one, again, not only in adults but also in children, hypertension and cardiovascular diseases are the two most common cause of death in children with chronic kidney disease, not only in children but also in adults. So what is the management? Okay, under your kidigo or kidney disease, Improving global outcomes, that is the leading authority in the management or guidelines on how to treat patients with kidney failure. So it is suggested that in children, a 24-hour mean arterial pressure by ambulatory blood pressure monitoring should be lowered to 50th percentile for age, sex, and height. Actually, this it has a computation, but it, this is actually uh, more are thoroughly discussed by a physician or doctor. So the, the key point here is only the 24-hour mean arterial pressure should be lowered less than 20th, 50th percentile, I mean, for age, sex, and height. For if you are, if you are using your RT, uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. But if you are using auscultatory, if you are going to use auscultatory, Blood pressure monitoring, that is commonly what we do in the hospital, clinics, center, etc. It should be lower to 90th percentile. Okay? So suggested monitoring of blood pressure should be what? Once a year if you are using ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. And it should be every three to six months if you are using your standard auscultatory blood pressure. That is what we are doing commonly in the hospital and etc. So if you are using ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, you, it should be once a year. If you are using only the common method, which is your auscultatory blood pressure monitoring every three to six months, okay? In relation to your fluids and electrolyte, so we say that hypervolemia that can lead to what? Hypertension. That is why very important to treat hypertension because that is one of the most common cause of death of your kidney failure. So again, what is ambulatory? Blood pressure monitoring. Basically, blood pressure is obtained on a frequent intermittent basis. So it is continuous with on and off. So the BP of the patient is being taken within the 20 within 24 hours with a 50 to 30 minutes interval. Okay, using a wearable device, usually outside the provider's office or medical hospital. So usually within the within 24 hours, the patient is wearing this kind of device. This is what we call a ambulatory blood pressure monitoring device, okay? So even at the home, the patient is being monitored by the BP. That is automated. So let's just, let's just skip this. Okay. Again, in children with hypertension, when there is no available ambulatory BP monitoring device, because in some far-flung areas with low resources, scarce resources, we cannot afford to get this kind of device. That is why if there is no ABPM, go for manual auscultation. That is why what I said, in your manual auscultation, the systolic blood pressure should be decreased in 90th percentile. So again, let's talk about how do we treat hypertension in relation to your fluid imbalance, which is hypervolemia. So one of the first line drugs that is being used in our kidney failure patient is your adjutensin converting enzyme inhibitor or your adjutensin receptor blockers as first line of your therapy. 
So these drugs actually lowers proteinuria, which is very important because although protein can lead to increase bl uh, uh, blood urea nitrogen, it is also important to regulate protein in our body. Because if there is no protein in our body, there will be no what? There will be no oncotic pressure. Hence, it can lead to what? Fluid shifting from intravascular compartment to interstitial compartment. That is a very big problem. That is why protein should be what? At protein should be put in normal levels. That is why ACE and ARBs are the first line of defense because are the first line of drugs because it lowers proteinuria. Meaning that protein is being reabsorbed in the body. That is why one of the functions of your kidney is basically what? Filtration and reabsorption. When we say filtration, we are going to filtrate the blood and we are going to reabsorb what? What is essential in our body, such as your what? Blood and protein. That is why if you have kidney failure, you cannot reabsorb that. That is why in kidney failure, you will see protein in the urine and blood in the urine. That is why you have hematuria and proteinuria or albuminuria. That is why if you do have those kinds of manifestation, that is a good indicator that you have a kidney problem. And also it is well tolerated. There is no adverse side effects, but it has a risk of what? Hyperkalemia and adverse effects of fetal risk. So it is teratogenic. So, ACE inhibitors and ARBs are teratogenic, meaning it is very harmful to the fetus and it can lead to hyperkalemia. That is why in taking your ACE inhibitors, check for what? Check for potassium levels. Because if you have very, very increased potassium levels, withhold your ACE inhibitors and go for other antihypertensive medications such as your what? Adjutensing. Adjutensin or what? Um, you have your alpha-1 adrenergic agonist. You have also what? Your alpha-2 adrenergic blockers or antagonist. You have also your beta-1 blockers or beta-1 adrenergic antagonist or blockers. So if proteinuria is present, as what I said, ACE inhibitor is the drug of choice because it lessens or it prevents the excretion of protein in the blood. Hence, lowering the progression of CKD. That is the beneficial effects. As what we said, decrease proteinuria and lowering the progression of your CKD. Why? Because hypertension is an intrarenal cause of kidney failure. When you say intrarenal cause, it can cause direct damage to the kidneys because of the increased pressure against the walls of the kidneys. That is why lowering the blood pressure is very important to lessen or to decrease what the progression or slowing the progression of chronic kidney disease. So it can be what? It can slow the progression from ESR, ESR, ESRD or end-stage renal disease stage 1 to stage 5. So recommended dosage is enalapril 0.1 mg per kilogram dose should be administered once daily. And the dose may be increased to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per day as a single dose or two divided doses, or that is what we call BID. ACE inhibitors treatment is also indicated if proteinuria and GFF is more than 30 ml. That is already your what? Stage 2 to stage 1 kidney failure. So if the creatinine increases by more than 25%, uh, increase fluid intake to dilute your creatinine and diuretic should be what? Discontinued. Because if there is increased levels of creatinine by more than 25%, that is a good indicator that the patient is already dehydrated. If the patient is already dehydrated, then there will be what? Fluid volume, uh, there is what? Hemo concentration. If, this, if there is already hemo concentration, okay, there is increased sensitivity to your what? Creatinine and also to your hematocrit. Okay? That is why if there is increased creatinine by more than 25%, increase oral fluid intake 
diuretic should be discontinued and those of ACE inhibitor should be what? Lower down that is halved or lower down. Are we clear? That is why it is very important to monitor the weight of the patient before and after dialysis to determine whether or not how much fluid are we going to remove from the patient. Because for example, if the patient is if the patient has only 2 liters weight gain and you are going to remove 5 liters of fluid from the patient, you are already removing much fluid from the patient. Basically, you are going to remove only 2 liters from the patient. So why is it you are going to remove 5 liters? Isn't it? That is why it is very important to weigh the patient before and after the dialysis to know your UF goal. That is what we call UF goal. Okay, The amount of fluid we are going to remove from the patient. And if renal function does not improve or hyperkalemia, hyperkalemia exceeds 5.5 milligrams or max per liter because the normal Potassium level is what? 3.5 to 5.5. In some books, it is 3.5 to 5.3. So if the potassium increases by more than 5.5, okay, please discontinue ACE inhibitors. Why? Because what I said earlier, one of the side effects of ACE inhibitors is what? Hyperkalemia. That is why in taking ACE inhibitors, monitor for potassium levels. Okay, let's skip this. Also, one of the drugs are your calcium channel blockers. They do not have renoprotective effects other than controlling BP. So basically, the main effect of calcium channel blockers is mainly lowering the blood pressure of the patient. Okay, they can also increase proteinuria and are best used in non-proteinuric patients. Meaning, the side effect or adverse effect of channel, calcium channel blockers is what? it increases the excretion of protein in the blood. So that is why it is very important that if the patient having kidney failure um, is excreting a lot of protein, then calcium channel blockers is contraindicated. But if the protein is normal, calcium channel blockers is good to go, good to administer to your patients. And it is also used what? Calcium channel blockers is also used in combination with ACE and you have your adjutensin 2 receptor blockers. Here in the Philippines, commonly uh, we, ref, uh, we, the doctors, um, uh, give medications such as your what? Calcium channel blockers such as your amdodifin, nifidipin, and ACE inhibitors such as your um, captopril, inalapril, propanolol, and etc. as a combination. So, for example, you have your, as what I said earlier, amlodipine, such as your, this is calcium channel blocker, amlodipine, 0.1 to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram per day as a single daily dose, maximum of 10 dose, 10 milligrams per day. So, other hypertensive drugs are your beta-2 blockers or antagonists such as your atenolol, 1 to 2 milligrams per kilogram as a single daily dose or in two divided dose per day, or that is what we call BID, two times a day. So to sum it up, here are the standard office blood pressure measurements. So just take a photo of this because we will go to far more important topics to be discussed. So this is what we call the blood measure management in children with CKD. So this is the international standard or guidelines for uh, monitoring or controlling hypertension. So you have your 10 gold rules, 10 golden rules. So let's just skip this. So that is why not only in children but also in adults, like what, what I said earlier, the mean arterial pressure by using 24-hour ambulatory BP monitoring or ABPM should be lowered to 50th percentile. If you are using auscultatory blood pressure, it should be lowered to 90th percentile. And what I said, monitoring BP once a year, if you are using ambulatory blood pressure, device, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring devices, and if it is auscultatory, 
which is the standard or what we commonly do in the hospital, we should do that every three to six months. And as what I said, as a golden rule, use adjutensin converting enzyme inhibitor or adjutensin receptor blockers as your first line therapy. Are we clear? Then again, like what I said, check for what? Creatinine levels in the blood because um, ACE and ARBs has a side effect of hyperkalemia. Because what I said, if the patient is having hyperkalemia, then discontinue ACE, then go for what? Other hypertensive medications. So other management of hyperkalemia. Other management of hyperkalemia, what will be your nursing consideration? Potassium restriction, basically. That is one of our health teaching to restrict potassium intake. So what are potassium-rich foods? The mnemonic is A, B, C. A is for what? Apple, apricot. B is for what? Banana. C is for what? Citrus fruits, cantaloupe, carrots. And you have your sports. What is sports? S-P-O-R-T-S. -S. S is for what? Strawberry. P is for what? Pineapple, potato. O is for what? Orange. R is for what? Raisins. T is for tomato. So those are your potassium-rich foods that will be restricted in your patient because again if the problem is increased as a compensatory mechanism or defense mechanism defense or negative feedback mechanism if the problem is, is increased the goal is to decrease right so if the problem is increased in potassium then the goal is to decrease the potassium levels that is very basic so potassium restriction and you will give what we call your Sodium polystyrene or polystyrene sulfonate, what we call kayexalate. Okay, in the board exam here in the Philippines to be uh, to become a registered nurse, one of the drug of choice for hyperkalemia is kayexalate or also known as your sodium polystyrene sulfonate. So when we say kayexalate, that is exchange resin. So when we say exchange resin, it is being given by mouth or per rectal. So when we say exchange resin, you are um, potassium for sodium, basically, or sodium for potassium. So basically, you are giving sodium to the patient. In exchange of that, you are going to take potassium from the patient and you are going to excrete that via your feces. So one of the nursing considerations in giving your kayaxalate or sodium polystyrene sulfonate is what? Check if the patient is having constipation. If the patient is having constipation or paralytic ileus, contraindicated kayaxalate. Do not give kayaxalate because it can cause ulceration and you cannot excrete potassium because, again, kayaxalate excretes potassium through your feces. Exchange reason, sodium for potassium. I'm going to give you sodium, you're going to give me potassium and I'm going to excrete it via your feces. And one of the, also one of the emergency management for hyperkalemia is insulin plus glucose. Because if you're going to see here, I'm going to draw in order for you to understand. If this is the cell, if this is the cell, the cell is sad. And this is the blood vessel. If the cell is sad, because the cell is hungry, that is why the cell will use your what? Insulin as the key. Insulin as the key of the cell. Then you have here glucose. Then you have here potassium. So normally, if the cell is sad because the cell is deprived of glucose, the cell is hungry, the cell will use insulin because insulin is the key of the cell. So if the cell will use insulin, the mouth of the cell will open. If the mouth of the cell will open, the cell will eat the glucose. Not only glucose, but also potassium. Potassium is being eaten by the cell. Because as we all know, potassium is the major intracellular electrolyte of the cell. 98% of potassium is found intracellularly and 2% is extracellularly. Because we all know that the major extracellular electrolyte is sodium. So that is very important. 
insulin. Why is it we are giving glucose to prevent hypoglycemia? Because the side effect of insulin is hypoglycemia. So basically, the antidote of insulin is basically glucose. If you cannot see glucose, go for what? The highest glucose, the solution with the highest glucose content. Okay? So other nursing considerations, check for vital signs. Then ECG monitoring. ECG monitoring is very important. Why? Because we all know that hyperkalemia that can lead to what? Cardiac arrest. That can lead to cardiac arrest. Why is it? Because the main function of potassium is what? It controls smooth muscle contraction. It maintains contraction. Basically, what is a good example of smooth muscle? That is your heart. That is why potassium is very important. So if there is pot, uh, increase in potassium levels in the blood, it can lead to what? Arrhythmia, dysrhythmia that can lead to your cardiac arrest. That is why ECG monitoring is very important. A classic manifestation of hyperkalemia in your ECG is what? Tall, tinted, peak T wave and also ST segment elevation. And what I said, discontinued drugs that can cause hyperkalemia, such as your ACE inhibitors. Because what I said earlier, ACE inhibitors has a side effect of hyperkalemia, same as your beta blockers. So go for other antihypertensive medications. And you have your potassium sparing diuretics. So if you are going to say potassium sparing, you are going to spare the potassium. You are not going to excrete the potassium. That is why very important to check your electrolyte. No? If you're going to check your electrolytes, you are going to determine what type of diuretics you are going to give the patient. If the patient is having hyperkalemia, then go for potassium wasting diuretics such as your loop diuretic or osmotic diuretics such as your mannitol and your what? Furosemide. Furosemide Lasix is one example of your loop diuretic. If the patient is having hypokalemia, then go for what? Potassium sparing diuretics. But in this case, the nursing diagnosis is what? Hyperkalemia. So if the problem is increased potassium, then the goal is what? To decrease your potassium. So give your potassium wasting diuretics and discontinue potassium sparing diuretics. So what are examples of potassium sparing diuretics? That is your SAT. SAT is the mnemonic. You have your spirinolactone, aldactone. You have your amyloride and you have your triamterin. So other nursing consideration, the antidote in emergency cases in order for the patient to prevent cardiac arrest is calcium gluconate. So it should be found at the bedside of the patient or the crush in the crush cart or emergency cart. Okay, as an emergency drug for your what? Cardiac arrest, calcium gluconate. Why? Basic principle, like what I said, potassium maintains the cardiac contraction, whereas calcium initiates cardiac contraction. Calcium initiates cardiac contraction. That is why if you have dysrhythmia, arrhythmia, give calcium gluconate. Why? It normalizes the heart and rhythm of the heart. It normalizes the heart and rhythm of the heart, hence preventing cardiac arrest. So we have here um, the dosage, right? You have here the dosage of your calcium. But let's cap, let's just skip this. Uh, that is only um, dosage because we all know that the dosage still depends on the um, weight, height, or age of the patient. So these are only examples of dosage. So because of limited time, let's skip this. Then let's talk about other matters. Then also nursing consideration, monitor for kidney function. Because what I said, one of the classic manifestations of your kidney failure is hyperkalemia. Because again, one of the normal functions of your kidney is regulation of electrolytes, such as what? Potassium. Because we all know that potassium, 80 to 90% of potassium is basically excreted from the kidneys. It, be, it is being released by your kidneys. But because of kidney failure and kidney damage, you are not releasing or you are not excreting potassium. That is why you will have the nursing diagnosis of hyperkalemia. Are we clear? Then give your sodium bicarbonate. 
Because we all know, in the presence of hyperkalemia, you will have what? Metabolic. You will have metabolic acidosis. You will have metabolic acidosis. One of the one of the management of metabolic acidosis is by giving your sodium bicarbonate to counteract the acidosis. And especially, we as nurses, it is very important to monitor your vital size. In this case, monitor for what? Cardiac rate. Because as we all know, potassium can lead to what? Cardiac arrest. So other nursing considerations are your salbutamol via your nebulizer because there are recent studies under Kidigo that there is reduction of potassium in giving your salbutamol and nebulizer. Not only that, in relation to your hypervolemia, there is the shifting going to your respiratory system that can lead to what? Difficulty of breathing. That is why you are giving um, beta-2 adrenergic agonist stimulants such as your ventolin, salbutamol, albuterol, to widen the airway, to facilitate airway in order for the patient to what? Having patent airway in order for the patient to breathe normally. So that is dual effect. In order for the patient not to have or to relieve, alleviate, mitigate difficulty in breathing and to lower the potassium levels. And again, how do we control electrolyte imbalances in kidney failure? Dialysis. Because again, in your kidney failure, the gold standard treatment is dialysis. Again, don't get me wrong. The best, again, the best management of your kidney failure, the best remedy of your kidney failure is kidney transplant surgery. But the problem is kidney transplant is very expensive. So not all cannot, not all can afford. Okay, but the best treatment is kidney transplant surgery, but not all can afford. That is why other patients resort to what? Dialysis. It could be either hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. Are we clear? So again, hemodialysis is the gold standard or modality of preference. So other nursing consideration, give your potassium binders such as your... So these are new. There are recent studies that uh, pateromer, zirconium, and cyclosilicate are what? Are potassium binders. Hence, when we say potassium binders, you are going to bind the potassium in your blood and it is being excreted via your what? Via your body. But there are what? It is still in, it is still in research. It is still being studied whether or not it is effective. Okay? So let's talk about hypernatremia. Because the patient cannot excrete urine. Because again, one of the functions of your kidney is what? Regulation of electrolytes. But in this case, the patient cannot excrete. The patient cannot urinate. That is why you will have what? The classic hypernatremia. Increased sodium levels in the blood. That is why you will also have what? Hypertension. You will also have what? Hypertension. That is why very, 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 very fatal is very, very fatal is hypertension. Why? Because you already have what? You have already fluid volume excess. You have already flu hypervolemia. Then you have also what? Hypernatremia. We all know that the classic, the classic function or the classic, uh, the classic response of sodium is what? Where sodium goes, water follows. So if, the, if there is increased sodium, there is increased fluid. So in this case, there is already hypervolemia and this, there is already hypernatremia. That is why there is what? Hypertension in your kidney failure patients. Actually, um, one of the classic manifestations of kidney failure is basically hypertension. Okay, hypertension, hypertension is always the classic manifestation of kidney failure, hypertension. That is why one of the most common cause of death of kidney failure is cardiovascular diseases such as your what? Hypertension. So how do we treat hypernatremia? Sodium restriction. What is the normal sodium intake? What is the normal salt intake per day that is less than 2 grams per day? 
If you are talking about sodium chloride, the normal intake of sodium chloride per day is less than 5 grams. Okay? Then give your diuretics. Give your diuretics, then monitor weight. Question, how do we properly monitor the weight of the patient? Because again, monitoring weight is very important to determine whether or not how many ml of fluid are we going to remove from the patient to prevent hypovolemia, to prevent hypotension, to prevent death, or to prevent multiple organ failure in cases of what? Hemorrhagic or hypovolemic shock. Also to determine if the patient is having weight gain and weight loss. So how do we properly weigh the patient? In the morning, with the same clothes, with the same weighing scale, before breakfast, after voiding. Again, with the same clothes, same weighing scale, say uh, before breakfast, after voiding, and um, yes, again, you have your in the morning, weighing the patient should be what? In the morning, with the same clothes, same time, same weighing scale before breakfast after voiding. Are we clear? Monitor vital signs. Very important. We as nurses, because vital signs our is our what baseline data. And you will give your antihypertensive medications, such as again A, B, C, D. What is A, B, C, D? You have your adjutensin or their converting enzyme inhibitors such as your ACE. You also have your ARBs inhibitor or your angiotensin receptor 2 blockers. Also what? You have your alpha-1 adrenergic antagonist and you have your alpha-2 adrenergic antagonist or blockers. You have also B, beta blockers. You have also C, calcium channel blockers. And you have your D for diuretics. Also, nursing consideration, again, again, where sodium goes, water follows. So basically, if there is increased sodium levels, there will be what? Fluid shifting going to the intravascular space. So if there is fluid shifting from interstitial space going to intravascular space, because that is the process of osmosis, basically. When you are going to hear osmosis, that is what? Fluid shifting from lower concentration to higher concentration. In this case, there is hypernatremia. Again, if you're going to hear the word mia, 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 you are referring to your blood. Mia, 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 you are referring to your blood. In this case, hypernatremia, there is increased levels of sodium in the blood. So there will be what? Osmosis. There will be what? Fluid shifting from interstitial compartment going to intravascular compartment. That is what we call where sodium goes, water follows. That is why there will be what? In relation to hypernatremia, you will also have hypervolemia. So again, if there is fluid accumulation in the blood, flood will, will if flood will go, the fluid will go what, where? To the lungs. That is why check always X-ray. If you if there is no X-ray in the hospital, if there is calamity and the X-ray room were damaged, the radiograph room were damaged or in far flung um, areas that there is uh, scars in um, equipments, go for auscultating the lungs. Classic manifestation of fluids in the lungs is basically crackles and wheezing. Also check for ECG because again, fluid can go to your heart. Then if, there, if the patient is having kidney failure, go for dialysis, which is the treatment of choice. Then again, Fowler's position to alleviate difficulty of breathing, then safety. Why is it very important is safety? Because, because always remember, if there is problem in your sodium, you will have neurologic problems or neurologic symptoms. Again, as a general rule, if the potassium levels is the problem, then you will have what? Cardiac problem. Because it acts in your smooth muscle contraction. Whereas your sodium, okay, it can lead to what? Osmosis, fluid shifting. That can lead to what? Impairment of your cells. Okay? Especially your brain cells. That is why neurologic manifestation is you're going, you're going to monitor for neurologic manifestations. So in this case, because of hypernatremia, osmosis will take in. So there will be what? Fluid shifting from intracellular from the cell going to, in, to intravascular compartments. You are going to remove 
all of the fluid from the cell causing what? Cellular dehydration. That is why if there is cellular dehydration, um, dehydrate the neurons, the cells in your brains are dehydrated, you cannot function well. Okay? There will be what? There will be what? Uh, disorientation, confusion, um, imbalance that can lead to fall. That is why very important is safety. Because we as nurses, our goal, our priority is what? Safety. Then monitor for specific gravity. So again, as what I said, under our Kidigo, the normal sodium intake per day is what? Or normal salt intake per day is less than 2 grams. That's what I said earlier. And if it is sodium chloride, then it is what? Below 5 grams. Then, DASH diet and potassium-based salt substitutes are beneficial also. Then, exercise more. Then, hyperphosphatemia. Again, one of the functions of the kidney is what? Regulation of your electrolytes, such as your phosphorus. Because phosphorus is also what? excreted by your urine. So because of kidney failure, you cannot excrete phosphorus. That is why you have what we call nursing diagnosis, hyperphosphatemia. Okay? So what will be the management of hyperphosphatemia? Again, restriction of phosphorus. Phosphate binding agents. So what are examples of phosphate binding agents? You have your aluminum base, such as your ampogel. You have your calcium-based drugs, such as your TOMS. And you have your civilamir. Civilamir. Civilamir is very common here in the Philippines. These are put, these are phosphorus regulating agents, or it decreases the levels of your phosphorus. And you have your skincare. Why is it very important that you will have skincare? What are examples of skincare? Oatmeal bath, oatmeal bath, karaya, ointment. Other is what? Cold compress. Other is cold compress. Why is it very important to have skin care? As a compensatory mechanism. As a compensatory mechanism or negative feedback mechanism of the, the body. We all know or your body already knows that the problem is there is increased phosphorus level in the blood. That is why we have the nursing diagnosis of what? Hyperphosphatemia. So that is why your body will compensate. Because the goal is to decrease phosphorus in the blood. So your body will compensate. Your body, what will do is what? It will go into excrete phosphorus in the sweat glands. It will go into excrete phosphorus in the sweat glands. That is why kidney failure patient is having what? Itchiness, pruritus, urticaria. It is very, very itchy. That is why skin care is very important. Why? Especially cutting nails. You should instruct the patient to cut the nails. Why? If the patient is having long nails and his or her skin is very itchy, it can cause what? It can cause injury, portal of entry. It can cause infection. That is why skin care is very important. To alleviate itchiness, go for what? Oatmeal bath, oatmeal bath, um, karaya ointment, and what? Cold compress to alleviate the itchiness. And phosphate binding antacids again, you have your ampogel as your aluminum base, TOMS as your calcium base, and you have your civilamir. So guys, in relation to hyperphosphatemia, we all know that calcium and phosphorus are inversely proportional. Meaning, if there is increased phosphorus levels in the blood, you will have what? Decreased calcium levels in the blood. It is inversely proportional. Meaning, if there is increased calcium levels, there will be what? Decreased phosphorus level. If there is increased phosphorus level, there will be what? Decreased calcium levels because they are inversely proportional. Because phosphorus basically prevents absorption of your calcium. That is why in response to hyperphosphatemia, increase in phosphorus levels in the blood, there will be what? Hypocalcemia. That is why one of the Classic manifestations also of kidney failure is having hypocalcemia. That is why the patient having kidney failure is having what? Brittle bones. That is why later on we'll be talking about the management of hypocalcemia. Okay? 
So let's talk about hypocalcemia. Because again, we all know that if there is increased phosphorus levels in the blood, hence it can lead to what? Decreased calcium levels in the blood. Because phosphorus and potassium are what? I mean, sorry, phosphorus and calcium are inversely proportional. So what will be your nursing consideration? Increased calcium intake, right? Again, very simple. If the problem is decreased calcium levels in the blood or in the system, then the goal should be what? Increase calcium. Are we clear? So increase calcium intake. Increase vitamin D because vitamin D increases absorption of calcium in the GIT. Again, vitamin D, also known as your ergocalciferol, which is a fat-soluble vitamin under your micronutrients, right? Classic types of micronutrients are your fat-soluble and water-soluble vitamins. Example of your fat-soluble vitamins is your vitamin D or ergocalciferol. Ergo because, again, ergocalciferol or vitamin D increase absorption of calcium in the GIT. If there is decreased vitamin D in the blood, that is what we call for the adult osteomalacia, for the child that is rickets. Those are common board exam questions in the, here in the Philippines. And also one of the antidote is basically what? Calcium gluconate. Then monitor for fracture. How do we confirm fracture? By the use of your X-ray. Then tracheostomy set. Trach set should be at bedside and cricothyroidotomy. Why? Always remember, guys, that calcium also acts as it also regulates your smooth muscle contraction. So good example of smooth muscle is your entire body. Are we clear? Especially the throat. Because always remember, if there is decreased calcium levels, it can lead to increased contraction. It can increase to increase muscle contraction. If there is increased calcium levels, it can lead to what? Decreased contractions. Or it can lead to what? It can lead to your relaxation. It can lead to your paralysis. Whereas, the problem is if there is decreased calcium levels, there is what? Increased contractions. So in this case, the problem is hypocalcemia. So decreased calcium levels in the blood. So there will be what? Increased contractions. So the problem is what? That is why you have the classic manifestation of what? Hypocalcemia, the classic manifestation is your chivostic sign. By tapping the facial nerve, you have contraction of the facial muscles that can lead to your what? Twitching of the twitching of the cheeks and numbness of the oral cavity or the surrounding of your mouth. That is the classic chivostic sign. And you will also have what? Trosu sign. Trosu sign. What is very fatal is your what? Laryngeal spasm. Laryngeal spasm because in response to decreased calcium levels, it can lead to what? Increased contractions. That can lead to, to what? Laryngeal contractions, laryngeal spasm. Larynx is an airway. So if the airway will close, you cannot breathe. That is why go for what? That is why there is tracheostomy set at bedside or go for cricothyroidotomy. Why is it? Why is it that um, I did not put intubation set? Because intubation set or ET tube is being administered or being given by what? By mouth. Okay? Your ET tube will go to the mouth. The problem is what? There is what? Laryngeal spasm. So there is what? Narrowing of airway. So the ET tube cannot enter. There is what? What we call difficulty intubation. As a golden rule, among doctors, if there is difficulty intubation, the management should be what? Surgery. What surgery? Creation of tracheostomy and or cricothyroidotomy. Always remember that cricothyroidotomy is temporarily. It is done for emergency cases. Okay? So cricothyroidotomy, it is converted to tracheostomy later on. Then monitor for ECG. Because again, Calcium acts also or regul it regulates smooth muscle contraction. Also monitor vital signs. So nursing consideration, again, phosphate binding agents. 
Why are we going to give phosphate binding agents to decrease phosphorus? Are we clear? So in response to decrease phosphorus, your calcium will increase because again, calcium and phosphorus are inversely proportional. Then you have your seizure precaution. Also safety because there is also confusion and give your what I said earlier, give your activated vitamin D or calciferol. So what are the new guidelines under your Kidigo in the management of CKD in your mineral bone diseases or mineral bone, uh, yes, mineral bone diseases or the demineralization? So one therein is the target in lowering high serum phosphate. This is what I'm talking about earlier. Because if there is decreased phosphate levels, it can lead to calcium increase. Are we clear? So it is, recommend, it is recommended in chronic kidney disease that we should maintain serum calcium levels in age-appropriate normal range. So basically, if the patient is adult, child, and infant, what is the normal value of adult should be maintained? What is the normal value of calcium for the child? It should be maintained. What is the normal value of the, of the calcium in the in children or infants should be maintained. And also, we suggest using dialy dialysate concentration using calcium, okay? Such as in your peritoneal dialysis. So in your peritoneal dialysis or in also in your hemodialysis, the concentrations therein, your bicarbonate and acid should contain what? Calcium. And low, low phosphorus diet in your pediatric. So what are good examples? For example, if the patient is a pediatric patient, so the best milk in giving your pediatric patient is what? Similac PM 6040. Similac PM 6040. Are you clear? By the way, the, the, the number one cause or the risk factor for kidney failure in adult is diabetes. Secondary is hypertension and tertiary is what? Chronic glomerulonephritis. Whereas in your pediatric population, the common cause of kidney failure in your pediatric population is what? Polycystic kidney disease or immature kidney. Are we clear? Another, how do we treat abnormal parathyroid levels in the blood? So again, give your calcitriol. As what I said earlier, calcitriol, vitamin D, activated vitamin D. Then also in children and adolescents, it is recommended that treatment with recombinant human growth hormone when additional growth is desired. So we all know if there is problem in your calcium, there will be problem in your bones. If there is problem in the bones, you will have what? Growth retardation. So hence, you will have what? Impaired, disturbed body image or this uh, body image disturbance. That is why this is already recommended to give your growth hormone, okay? To maintain the height of the patient. Sorry, sir. Uh, our time is about finished. You still okay. have a slide? Um, I think I have only a few slides left. Okay. Just give me one to two minutes. I will be done. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you so much. So again, phosphate binders, as what I said earlier, such as your aluminum base, ampogel, and calcium-based tomes, and sevilamir. Okay? Then restriction of your phosphorus. Again, because calcium and phosphorus are inversely proportional. If there is hyperphosphatemia, you will have what? Hypocalcemia. That is why restriction of dairy products, grain, cereals, soft drinks, soft foods containing baking powder because they are, these are what? Phosphorus-rich. Okay? And these are the most common used phosphate binders such as your what? Calcium acetate and calcium acetate or sevilamir. The problem is these are more expensive and not commonly used in children. Okay? Then calcium carbonate such as tetralac, one to four tablets, three times a day or TID. Then you have your sevilamir. Okay? Also, give your activated vitamin D. These are the dosages, as what I said earlier. Also, calcidiol. Give calcidiol to increase calcium intake or calcium going to the bones. Okay? 
Then other treatment of your um, mineral bone disorder is what? Correction of acidosis. Again, why is it there is acidosis? Because of what? Increase potassium levels, increase creatinine, and increase BUN levels. Or there is azotemia. So how, how do we correct that? Because azotemia can also what impair the growth and development of the bones. So correction of acidosis can improve the growth, prevent bone demineralization, and help helps manage your hyperkalemia. So how do we treat acidosis? Give your sodium bicarbonate or maintain serum sodium in normal levels. So thank you so much. That will be all. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum to all. Terima kasih, Sir Prof. Eh, Prof. Sir James. There is a, we go to question and session. It's about maybe uh, five minutes. There is a question from, again, Dr. Ahmad Fatoni. Any diagnosis special about diuretic in the explain always potassium. My question is, how about sodium or natrium or salt? Okay. Again, going back, um, what I said, anatomy and physiology is very important. When we say anatomy and physiology, we should know the function, the normal function of an organ. In this case, we are talking about kidney. So one of the normal functions of the kidney is basically regulation of your um, electrolytes. In this case, um, 80 to 90% of potassium is excreted by the kidney, also phosphorus, right? So because of kidney failure, you have the problem of what? Hyperkalemia and hyperphosphatemia. Because you cannot regulate or you cannot excrete pot you cannot excrete potassium and phosphorus. Okay. So in this case, in the treatment of hyperkalemia, if the problem is hyperkalemia, you should treat the patient to what? Potassium restriction. You give what? Um, diuretics, which has put which is your potassium wasting. And you have your hyperphosphatemia. So in your hyperphosphatemia, go for what? Uh, phosphorus binding agent and restriction of your what? Phosphorus containing foods. When we're asking your what? Sodium. The problem in your sodium, guys, because you cannot also excrete fluids because of kidney failure. Because we all know that the normal function of the kidney is what? Um, creation of urine and excretion of urine. But because of kidney failure, you cannot do that. That is why there is also fluid accumulation and sodium accumulation. So that is why the classic electrolyte imbalances of kidney failure are what? Hyperkalemia, hypernatremia, hyperphosphatemia, and hypocalcemia. Because phosphorus and calcium are inversely proportional. That is why one also of the management for kidney failure in relation to hypervolemia and hypernatremia is what? Fluid restriction and sodium restriction. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Again, there is a question from Dr. Ahmad Fatoni. If the disturb in kidney, how about an angiotensin aldosterone system to make disturb hemostasis special water? How intervention nursing about these situations? Sorry, ma'am. Can you repeat the question? Um, hmm. I think how about training angiotensin and aldosterone system? In hemostasis, uh, and how about our nursing intervention about that? In okay. the problem. Okay, because um, one of the one also of the important functions of your kidney is your regulation of your renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So basically, the kidney releases renin, and the liver produces your angiotensinogen. So because of that, your renin angiotensinogen, it can lead to what? Um, formation of your angiotensin 1. Um, if I can, for a while, I'll just, um, in order to explain that further, where is my screen? Yeah. So I'm just going to draw a... Okay. So 
Sorry, for a while. Okay. Can you see my slide? Yes, yes, it's clear. So this is the pathophysiology. In response to low BP, in response to low blood pressure levels, the goal should be what? To increase the blood pressure. But because of that, because of low blood pressure level, levels, the kidney will produce your renin. Because of the circulation ren, because of the circulation, because of the circulating renin, your liver will also produce your angio. Tensino gen. Okay, when renin is in, in contact with angiotensino gen, it will produce your what? Angiotensin. Angiotensin one. Angiotensin one is a weak constrictor, vasoconstrictor. That is why there is no effect. So we need to go, we need to convert angiotensin 1 to angio, angiotensin mm. 2. So before that, angiotensin 1 will go to the kidneys. I uh, will go to the lungs. Because in the lungs, you will have what we call ACE. ACE is angiotensin converting enzyme. That is why from the word itself, angiotensin converting enzyme. So we are going to convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 because angiotensin 2 is a pot potent vasoconstrictor that increases your blood pressure because the goal is to increase blood pressure. Also, your angiotensin 2 will stimulate your what? Posterior pituitary gland. Because in your posterior pituitary gland, we have what we call antidiuretic hormone. For what? Fluid reabsorption. So there, if there is fluid reabsorption, hypervolemia, hence hypertension. That is why it is also can lead to increased blood pressure. Not only that, angiotensin 2 will also stimulate your what? Adrenal gland. Because in your adrenal gland, it produces your GMA, your glucocorticoid, mineralocorticoid, and androgen. Specifically, mineralo, mineralocorticoid. Mineralocorticoid, that is your what? Aldosterone. Aldosterone or that is what we call extra salt. So again, as a principle where sodium goes, water follows. If there is increased sodium, there is increased water that can lead to what? Increased BP. This is what we call the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Mm -hmm. so in the treatment of kidney failure, we can give what? In lowering, because the problem in your kidney failure, there is already what? There is already increased blood pressure because of um, hypervolemia and hypernatremia. So how, how can we treat this in relation to your renin adjutensin aldosterone system? We can give your what? We can give your renin blockers. We can give your renin blockers to lower the BP. If there is renin blockers, then you cannot produce your renin there is no conversion or there is no what? There is no angiotensin 1. Then there is no increase in BP. We can also give your angiotensin. You have your angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or your ACE inhibitors in order to prevent what? Conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Then there is no increase in your blood pressure. Or you can also give your what? ARBs. What is ARBs? Angiotensin receptor blockers. It also prevents the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Hence, there is no increase in your blood pressure. Okay? Okay, it, um, wow. Finish that? Yes, yes, yes. Wow, it's really clear, isn't it, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Ahmad Fotoni? Because with this part of flow, part of flow directly with from uh, Sir James. Really, you really expect about this, sir. Wow. And again, a question from Angia. I want to ask about patient with unstable condition, hypotension and unresponsive in mental status. The patient need dialysis. What is the standard vital sign for the dialysis procedure? Okay. Before performing dialysis, the vital sign should be normal especially the blood pressure. Sometimes if the blood pressure is, is increased, we go still for dialysis because one of the mechanism of action of hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis is to remove 
excess fluid from the patient. Hence, lowering the blood pressure. So if there is hypertension, no problem. The problem is what? Hypotension. If the patient is having hypotension, we cannot proceed to dialysis. Why? Because you are removing basically the blood of the patient going to the dialyzer to be, to be what? To be cleansed. Removing the excess fluid and removing the waste products. So it can lead to further hypotension. It can lead to what? It can lead to hypovolemic shock. So how do we treat that? For example, emergency cases, we really need to perform dialysis. But the problem is hypotension. The patient is hypotensive. So how can we do that? Mm. During dialysis, we can give blood transfusion. Mm. Do, during dialysis, we can give the blood transfusion. So during dialysis, you are giving the patient blood transfusion to increase the blood pressure. That is what we do. Mm. Or during dialysis, uh, because the, in the machine, we have um, what we call um, stages. We have uh, what we call, um, um, we, uh, we regulate basically the machine. So with, uh, we regulate the machine, for example, for the first hour, um, limited fluid is removed. For example, for the first hour, it's only 500 ml. For the second hour, it is one liter. For the third hour, one liter for the fourth hour, um, 500 ml. So in order to decrease or in order for the fluid to be removed gradually, that, uh, that is what we do during the dialysis. Okay, I think it's clear, isn't it, Ms. Angia? The, uh, it's answer your question before in the first session and also the second session. So first of all, we will give the blood transfusion, isn't it, sir? Yes, yes, blood transfusion. Okay. Okay, is there any question? But actually, we already uh, run off our time. <laughs> it's already uh, out of time, <laughs> actually. Thank you so much, uh, Sir James. It's really clear. And I cannot stop uh, watching the material because it's really good. But uh, unfortunately, the time is up. Uh, so we have to finish our discussion today about the fluid and electrolytes balance in chronic kidney disease. And maybe you want to give uh, your closing statement, sir? Um, actually, I was not able to prepare a closing statement. <laughs> because but, a lot okay. of information. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I will just say this. Um, as a healthcare provider, such as doctors and nurses and etc., um, we should love our profession. Because if we love our profession, we can give the best treatment to our patient. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because if we can, if we don't love our profession, we cannot execute accurately the interventions to our, towards our patient. So basically, um, even, even, even the salary is low. <laughs> even the, yeah, right? That is, that is, I uh, know, that is a reality. Reality. Our institutions that, even uh, healthcare providers receive low salary, but still love your profession. Because if you love your profession, you can, you can give the best intervention to your patient. Hence, saving the life of the patient. That is why Dr. Ali said, even you only save one life as if you already save humanity. Mm. So thank you so much. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum to all. Well, thank you so much, Sir uh, James. It's really, really nice closing statement. So, uh, please, audience, love your your job because you save almost humanity life. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, uh, Pro Sir James. I really sorry if there is I from deepest of my heart I do apologize if any mistaken during this. Oh, no problem, no problem. I understand. Thank you so much. And see you again tomorrow with our yes. next topic. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you, you so much, sir. Thank you so much. I see you tomorrow. Thank see you. See you tomorrow. Wow. It's really nice to hours. We got a lot of information from both our international speaker from Philippines and also Malaysians. So uh, I give it back to Miss Ingrid because we have already the 
third speaker from Indonesia. Miss Ingrid? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. This already Sir Adam here with us. Hello, Mr. Adam. How are you today, Muhammad Adam? Yeah. 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 Mr. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Wow, this is famous speaker also. We, we see yeah. you. <laughs> terkenal ya. Waduh, ini bahasa ya. Sudah terkenal, terkenal ini ya. Paling sangat terkenal di mana-mana nih. Baik, <laughs> baik. Oke, okay. so James, terima kasih banyak ya. Boleh di close PowerPoint-nya. Can you close the PowerPoint, sir, James? Sir James, I'm sorry. Can you close the slide? Thank you so much. Wow. Uh, thank you, Mr. James. Baiklah. Saya serahkan kepada Miss Ingrid. Ya, yeah, baik. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Nasrah Manisakina, Eskap MKM as a moderator. Then thank you so much for Dr. Abdul Ali Raja Muhammad AESA from Malaysia. And thank you so much for Mr. Jonathan James Ibanez Quiro, RNCNN from Philippines. So have explained for the material is amazing, yeah. Wow, some new knowledge from... Uh, Dr. Abdul Ali Raja Muhammad and Mr. Jonathan James Ibanez Quiro, our NCNN is so acknowledged for us, ya. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mom Nina. Ya, tadi kita sudah ke Malaysia dan Filipina ya. Wow, kita udah jauh nih jalan-jalannya. Sekarang kita kembali lagi menuju Indonesia. Ya, di sini ada pembicara yang ketiga, yaitu Bapak uh, Nes Muhammad Adam MKP SPKMB from Indonesia. Beliau akan meng... meng Jelaskan tentang interpretation blood gas analysis Henderson and Stewart method. Betul ya Pak Adam ya? Karena di sini Pak Adam yeah. sudah siap. Saya sebelum Bapak Adam memberikan materi, saya akan menjelaskan terlebih dahulu sedikit tentang kurikulum beliau. Ya di sini beliau bernama Nes Muhammad Adam M Club Aspek KMB. Beliau sekarang bekerja di instalasi gawat darurat rumah sakit Universitas Indonesia RSUI. Betul ya Pak ya? Betul. betul. Dan di Departemen Keperawatan Medikal Bedah Fakultas Ilmu Keperawatan Universitas Indonesia. Lalu uh, beliau mempunyai um, pendidikan yang terakhir dan sampai sekarang yaitu Magister Ilmu Keperawatan dan Nurse Spesialis Keperawatan Medical Bedah dari Fakultas Ilmu Keperawatan di Universitas Indonesia. Betul ya, Pak? Iya, rekan-rekan bisa uh, melihat di sini pengalaman organisasi beliau sangat banyak ya. Wow, luar biasa Pak Adam ini ya. Sangat fenomenal ini. Sudah terkenal di mana-mana beliau ya, ya Pak Adam ya. Iya, ya. ya, dan di sini terdapat riwayat, riwayat pelatihan pun sudah banyak. Beliau mengikuti pelatihan-pelatihan di luar ya. Bagaimana kabar Pak Adam hari ini? Apakah sehat Pak? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Baik, baik karena uh, Pak Adam sudah terlihat sangat Siap untuk menyampaikan materi pada hari ini, saya berikan kepada Bapak Adam. Time is your, Pak Adam. Baik, terima kasih. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah. 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 Semoga di siang hari ini kita semua dalam kondisi baik dan juga sehat. Dan terima kasih kepada DPK Pendidikan atas undangannya untuk bisa kita saling berbagi. Dan untuk saya diberi kesempatan untuk membawakan materi terkait asam basah. Kali ini interpretasi membandingkan dua pendekatan antara pendekatan tradisional yang sering juga disebut dengan metode Henderson Hasselbach dan yang kedua adalah metode yang sebetulnya tidak terlalu baru juga ya tapi 
dibandingkan dengan Henderson Hasselbas, Stewart ini lebih baru. E, nanti kita coba lihat seperti apa perbandingan sudut pandang antara kedua metode ini ya dalam melakukan interpretasi asam basa. Saya mohon izin share screen. Suara saya jelas ya? Jelas Pak. Ya. Saya tampilkan. Oke, mudah-mudahan suara dan slide jelas ya. Alhamdulillah jelas Pak. Oke baik. Bisa dilanjutkan. Ya, ini saya bawakan materi bahasa Indonesia atau bahasa Inggris. Boleh bahasa Indonesia Pak. Bahasa Indonesia saja. Iya ya, boleh. Baik. <tuh> saya menyiapkan dua slide kalau bahasa Inggris berarti saya berpindah ke slide yang satunya. Tapi ini bahasa Indonesia ya. Iya baik Pak. Uh, ini sudah dikenalkan. Saya juga lihat di daftar pesertanya eh, mayoritas Indonesia ya. Mudah-mudahan ngomong kita lebih nyambung. Eh, lingkup pokok bahasan yang akan kita coba ulas. Yang pertama gangguan keseimbangan asam basa. Kemudian eh, mengapa mempelajari asam basa ini penting? Nah, karena eh, itu dia punya dampak kalau terjadi gangguan asam basa. Kemudian kita coba akan lihat faktor-faktor apa saja yang mempengaruhi kesembangan asam basa. Di sini kita akan coba lihat ya ternyata dalam menentukan faktor-faktor yang mempengaruhi asam basa itu berbeda antara Henderson Hasselbach atau metode tradisional dengan metodenya si Stewart. Nah inilah yang nanti yang akan menjadi Pembeda mengapa antara Stewart dan juga Henderson Hasselbach itu berbeda cara menginterpretasi asam basanya karena dari faktor-faktor yang mempengaruhi asam basanya saja itu dia berbeda sudut pandang. Kemudian karena berbeda faktor-faktor yang mempengaruhi keseimbangan asam basa nanti dalam mengklasifikasikan gangguan asam basa juga itu dia berbeda antara metode Henderson Hasselbach dan juga Stewart. Dan yang terakhir, jika waktunya masih ada, kita coba lihat seperti apa penerapan interpretasi asam basa dengan menggunakan metode Henderson Hasselbach dan yang kedua adalah metode Stewart. Ini waktunya sudah siang begini ya. Ini mudah-mudahan GCS-nya masih 15 ya. Atau sudah mulai terasa ada gangguan asam basa? Karena sudah siang ya Pak ya. <laughs> Baik. Uh, slide pertama saya coba menunjukkan uh, bagaimana upaya tubuh yang luar biasa untuk bisa mempertahankan secara ketat supaya kondisi pH dalam tubuh kita itu tetap dalam kadar yang normal. Kita ketahui kadar normal pH itu adalah 7,35 sampai 7,45. Ini kalau kita lihat selisihnya ini sangat kecil. Hanya bukan selisih 1, 2, atau 3, bukan. Tapi ini selisihnya hanya 0,1. Dan ini membuat tubuh kita itu harus membuat pengaturan yang sangat ketat. Bagaimana tubuh melakukan pengaturan? pH itu hanya akan normal jika tubuh itu mampu membuat perbandingan kadar antara PCO2 dan HCO3 itu dalam perbandingan 1 banding 20 atau rasionya itu 1 banding 20. 1 PCO2 itu berbanding dengan HCO3 sebanyak 20. Jadi kalau PCO2-nya naik 1, maka HCO3-nya itu harus turun 20. Jadi begitu supaya akan selalu setimbang antara PCO2 dengan HCO3. Dulu mungkin kita pernah diajarkan persamaan ini ya. Persamaan ini diperkenalkan oleh Henderson Hasselbach untuk uh, mengetahui derajat keasaman atau kita singkat dengan pH. pH itu normalnya harus berada di antara 7,35 sampai 7,45 atau kalau kita ambil rata-rata paling normalnya itu adalah 7,4. 
Pak, coba kita lihat ya. PH ini kan rumusnya dia seperti ini ya. Ini 6,1 ditambah logaritma hasil 3 dibagi hasil 2. Ya. Nah, ini kalau kita masukkan ini 6,1 ini adalah konstanta. Kemudian dimasukkan ke dalam rumus logaritma, maka kita akan dapatkan angka 7,4 ya. Inilah upaya yang dilakukan oleh tubuh PCO2 dan CO3 itu harus selalu dalam rasio 1 banding 20. Ya. Nah, ini kita coba lihat secara uh, simbolis jika PCO2 nya 1 maka hasil 3 nya jumlahnya harus uh, 20 nah, mengapa pH ini menjadi penting karena pH ini semacam suasana lingkungan ya kalau kita bayangkan dengan kondisi di yang lebih real gitu ya, karena pH ini tidak terlihat tapi kalau kita coba bandingkan dengan kondisi real, pH ini semacam apa ya, suasana iklim atau cuaca gitu ya. Kalau di kehidupan sehari-hari cuaca. Jadi pH ini adalah suasana di dalam tubuh yang menentukan apakah tubuh itu bisa melangsungkan kehidupan atau tidak. Untuk bisa seorang manusia itu bertahan hidup, pH-nya itu harus berada dalam rentang 7,35 atau 7,45 atau ada dalam kondisi yang sangat ekstrim terjadi penurunan pH atau terjadi peningkatan pH yang ekstrim walaupun terjadi penurunan pH pH itu tidak boleh turun kurang dari 6,8 dan kalaupun meningkat tidak boleh lebih dari 8 karena yang memungkinkan seseorang suasana iklim ya atau cuaca di dalam tubuh itu untuk bisa bertahan hidup itu hanya berada di kisaran 6,8 sampai 8,0. Jadi kalau kita bayangkan misalnya di iklim atau cuaca di lingkungan kita ya, kalau terlalu panas itu tidak memungkinkan untuk kita bertahan untuk terlalu dingin juga tidak bisa atau misalnya terlalu kering itu juga tidak bisa atau dia terlalu lembab atau basah itu juga tidak bisa. Nah, ini kalau kita ibaratkan dengan pH itu semacam itu. Jadi, di cuaca, suasana di dalam tubuh itu bisa tubuh itu melangsungkan kehidupan. Terutama yang bisa membuat kita terus-menerus bisa melangsungkan kehidupan itu adalah sel-sel itu bisa menghasilkan metabol, bisa melakukan metabolisme yang nantinya akan menjadi energi untuk menjadi bekal kita melangsungkan kehidupan. ya Tiap organ-organ di dalam tubuh kita itu bisa melangsungkan kehidupannya karena ada energi yang terus disuplai oleh tubuh dan energi itu diproduksi dari aktivitas metabolisme. Jadi coba bisa dibayangkan misalnya kalau metabolisme itu tidak berlangsung dengan baik karena karena tubuh kita dalam suasana yang tidak memungkinkan terjadi metabolisme yang optimal, maka produksi energi akan berkurang. Dan jika produksi energi berkurang, bahkan mungkin sampai nanti tidak ada produksi energi, maka dalam kondisi seperti itu, pasien itu dalam kondisi terancam jiwanya atau bahkan e, mengalami kondisi e, meninggal. Ya. Nah, kita coba lihat ini, e, asidosis itu kalau ekstrim, ini hanya sampai 6,8 saja, dan kalau alkalosis, kalaupun terjadi peningkatan secara ekstrim, itu hanya di tahap 8,0 saja. Ini, inilah rentang kita itu masih bisa bertahan itu. <tuh> kalau asam basa itu adalah suatu suasana, maka kalau dia terjadi peningkatan eh, pH yang ekstrim atau terjadi penurunan pH yang ekstrim, maka ini akan berdampak pada tubuh. Sebetulnya dampaknya ini adalah hasil dari upaya tubuh untuk melakukan kompensasi. ya. Tapi kalau kemudian kompensasi itu eh, terjadi kegagalan karena kompensasi itu juga ada batas kemampuannya. Jadi walaupun tubuh memang dibekali dengan kemampuan untuk melakukan kompensasi, tapi kompensasi itu juga ada batasannya. Ya. Nah misalnya pada asidosis berat apa akibatnya? Dan pada alkalosis berat apa akibatnya? Gangguan asam basa kalau sudah terjadi gangguan yang sangat berat maka itu akan berdampak pada empat fungsi tubuh. Empat fungsi tubuh inilah yang menjadi penentu seseorang itu bisa bertahan hidup atau tidak. Fungsi yang pertama adalah fungsi jantung atau kardiovaskular. Pada kondisi asidosis, terlalu asam di dalam tubuh, 
maka ini akan menyebabkan gangguan pada kontraksi jantung dan juga ini bisa berdampak pada pembuluh darah akan menyebabkan vasodilatasi pada arteri kemudian pada vena sebaliknya terjadi vasokonstriksi ya inilah kelamaan dia akan menurunkan curah jantung dan kalau tidak tertangani eh, makanya kita akan sering menemukan pasien-pasien yang mengalami asidosis itu dia akan berujung pada kondisi shock dan mengalami aritmi ya karena asidosis itu berdampak pada fungsi kardiovaskuler. Kemudian pada kondisi alkalosis ini terjadi sebaliknya kalau vasodilatasi ketika terjadi asidosis maka kalau pada alkalosis akan terjadi vasokonstriksi arteri. Yang sebetulnya nanti ujung-ujungnya sama ya akan terjadi penurunan curah jantung dan juga akan menyebabkan pasien mengalami aritmia. Nah kemudian pada pada fungsi paru kalau terjadi asidosis, ini akan menyebabkan hiperventilasi. Kenapa hiperventilasi? Karena CO2 dalam tubuh itu dia bersifat asam. Sehingga kompensasi tubuh seseorang, kalau terjadi penumpukan CO2, maka eh, paru itu akan dipicu untuk eh, melakukan hiperventilasi supaya CO2 yang tertumpuk di dalam tubuh yang menyebabkan asidosis itu bisa terbuang melalui ekspirasi. Ya, beda kalau terjadi hipoventilasi maka tubuh itu dia supaya bisa mendapatkan banyak karbon dioksida maka karbon dioksida itu ditimbun jadinya upaya nafas itu malah dikurangi ya nah ini sebaliknya kemudian pada metabolisme dan juga pada fungsi saraf ini hampir sama efeknya ketika terjadi asidosis berat atau alkalosis berat kita coba bisa lihat ya kalau pada Asidosis berat, pH sangat turun, maka akan terjadi peningkatan kebutuhan metabolisme, terjadi juga resistensi insulin, penurunan sintesis ATP, dan terjadi peningkatan degradasi protein. Nah, pada kondisi ini, karena banyak terjadi degradasi protein, kita itu akan banyak melihat ini ya, keton-keton gitu ya. Nah, ini dan laktat-laktat ditemukan pada tubuh. Sehingga nanti kita bisa temukan pasien itu mengalami asidosis karena terjadinya proses laktat. Laktat itu terjadi dari metabolisme yang terus dipaksakan terjadi, tapi karena energinya terbatas, ATP-nya terbatas, maka yang terbentuk ada efek sampingnya adalah terjadinya laktat. Nah, kemudian pada alkalosis, metabolismenya ini terjadi stimulasi glikolisis anaerob hipokalemi, hipomagnesemi dan hipofastatemi. Jadi ini juga bisa bisa kita lihat ya bahwa kalau terjadi gangguan asam basa utamanya kalau terjadi alkalosis itu akan membuat perpindahan-perpindahan sel dari perpindahan pertimbangan elektrolit antara di dalam sel dengan di luar sel dan ini akan mempengaruhi. Jadinya eh, pada alkalosis itu yang harusnya <tuh> Kalium itu e, berada banyak di dalam ini ya di dalam sel. Kali ketika terjadi alkalosis maka yang kalium kalium yang juga sudah sedikit di luar itu juga akan dipaksa masuk ke dalam sel sehingga oleh tubuh terbacanya hipokalemi. Padahal sebetulnya tidak bukan pasiennya itu betul betul mengarahi penurunan kalium ya bukan tapi karena kalium yang ada di dalam darah itu terdorong masuk ke dalam intrasel. Nah, kemudian ketika nanti pH-nya normal, maka kalium-kalium yang tertumpuk banyak dalam intrasel itu nanti lama-lama akan keluar ke dalam pasar, sehingga akan menormalkan eh, kondisi eh, kadar dari elektrolit. Sehingga kadang-kadang eh, jika terjadi gangguan elektrolit pada pasien yang disertai dengan gangguan pH, maka fokus pertama penanganan kita itu bukan langsung dikoreksi elektrolitnya. Karena kadang-kadang elektrolit itu terjadi penurunan atau peningkatan, itu karena karena hanya gangguan distribusi saja. Dia tertumpuk di dalam sel atau dia ter, dikeluarkan terlalu banyak di dalam sel. Sehingga kadang pendekatan pertama untuk penanganannya adalah uh, dis, diseimbangkan dulu pH-nya. Karena setelah pH itu seimbang, maka akan terjadi redistribusi ulang sesuai dengan uh, tempatnya masing-masing elektrolit itu, ya. Mudah-mudahan bisa dipahami ya. 
Kemudian pada fungsi neurologi ini uh, hampir sama. Nanti ujungnya itu adalah penurunan kesadaran. Ya, walaupun bisa terlihat kalau pada asidosis itu pasiennya tampak lebih tenang dan kalau pada alkalosis itu uh, pasiennya itu tampak lebih aktif ya, bisa gelisah, tetanik, kejang. Ya, walaupun lama-lama juga akan uh, masuk ke dalam kondisi stupor atau penurunan kesadaran. Oke, okay, saya tidak tahu ini uh, audiensnya bisa bisa ikutan komen atau tidak ya? Mohon maaf Pak, tidak bisa. Tidak bisa ya, oke. Okay, iya. Nah, jadi di layar uh, monitor saya... nanti munculnya pembicara dan panitia saja Pak. Oke okay, baik. Ya. Tidak ada masalah. Baik. <tuh> uh, saya ingin memperlihatkan ini supaya lebih sederhana analoginya ya antara pendekatan uh, Stewart dan Henderson Hasselba. Henderson, Hasselba, dan Stewart ini sebenarnya dia melihat fenomena yang sama. Contohnya di sini saya ambil e, contoh misalnya gelas yang berisi air ya. Nah ini saya sangat yakin kalau saya tanyakan ke audiens, ini akan ada yang menjawab bahwa ini setengah penuh dan ada juga yang menjawabnya setengah kosong. Nah ini silakan dijawab dan disimpan jawabannya ke dalam diri masing-masing ya karena saya tidak bisa lihat jawabannya. Ini juga yang dilihat oleh Henderson, Asurba, dan Stewart. Dia melihat fenomena yang sama, tapi nanti kemudian fokusnya berbeda. Ada yang fokusnya ke bagian kosongnya, ada yang fokusnya ke bagian penuhnya. Padahal ini sebetulnya kondisi yang sama. Pasien yang sama, peristiwa yang dialami oleh pasien, peristiwa yang sama, namun kemudian nanti sudut pandangnya menjadi berbeda. Karena ada yang fokus ke bagian penuhnya, ada yang ada yang fokus ke bagian yang kosong. Tadi sudah menjawab ya. Saya coba interpretasi. Ini ini juga sebetulnya adalah tes psikologi ya, yang pernah dilakukan oleh seorang ahli psikologi untuk menilai apakah seseorang itu memiliki kecenderungan ke arah pesimistik atau dia ke kecenderungan optimistik. Nah. Kalau tadi ada yang mengatakan ini setengah kosong, maka ini lebih ke arah orang ini pesimis, ya mencari-cari kekurangan, minder, fokus pada masalah bukan solusi. Sementara kalau menjawabnya tadi setengah penuh, maka ini kecenderungan orangnya itu adalah optimis, ya mensyukuri apa yang dimiliki, percaya diri, fokus pada solusi. Nah ini. Uh, Mungkin ada yang mengatakan pesimis itu jelek, optimis itu selalu bagus. Pengalaman saya di dalam praktek kita di sebagai seorang perawat, optimis terus menerus itu juga tidak tidak selalu baik. Misalnya kita melihat pasien kita itu penurunan kesadaran, gitu ya. Kalau kita terlalu optimis, maka kita akan menganggap ini pasiennya bagus nih, udah tenang, gitu ya. Padahal kondisi pasien tenang itu bisa banyak penyebab ya bisa saja dia sedang mengalami misalnya penurunan glukosa penurunan BCS gitu ya belum tentu tenang dia itu merasanya nyaman bukan nah sehingga kadang-kadang pesimis itu juga diperlukan nah sehingga kalau bagi kita seorang perawat baik itu pesimis atau optimis apakah pesimis itu baik apakah optimis itu malah lebih baik ya tergantung kondisinya ya Optimis terus menerus itu juga akan membuat kita kadang bisa kelolosan atau teledor melihat kondisi perburukan pasien. Pesimis terus menerus juga itu akan membuat kita bisa jadi frustasi ya karena terlalu memikirkan apa yang bagian kurang atau bagian aspek perburukan pada pasiennya tapi tidak melihat bahwa tubuh manusia itu juga ada proses pemulihan, ada proses kompensasi yang bisa dijalankan. Jadi optimis dan pesimis ini kalau bagi saya seseorang perawat itu mesti berimbang ya, mesti berimbang tergantung kondisinya dan harus tahu kapan harus pesimis, kapan harus optimis. Baik, kemudian faktor yang mempengaruhi pH sebetulnya antara Henderson, Asolba dan Stewart itu punya kesimpulan yang sama sebetulnya bahwa pH itu dipengaruhi oleh dua komponen, komponen respirasi dan komponen metabolik. Ini sama ya, di level ini sama pendapat. Sama sudut pandang. Nah, kemudian respirasi itu dipengaruhi oleh kadar CO2. Baik pada Henderson Hasselbaum maupun Stewart ini masih sama, masih sama pendapatnya. Tidak berbeda pendapat antara 
Stewart dan Henders Hasselbach bahwa respirasi itu dipengaruhi oleh kadar CO2. Nah, perbedaannya di mana? Kalau gitu perbedaannya adalah di komponen metabolisnya. Kalau Henders dan Hasselbach mengatakan bahwa metabolik itu hanya dipengaruhi oleh HCO3 saja, ya. Sementara menurut Stewart bukan HCO3, HCO3 itu hanya dampaknya saja, ya. Justru metabolik itu dipengaruhi oleh yang namanya SID dan weak acid. SID ini adalah singkatan dari strong ion difference. Kemudian weak acid ini adalah asam lemak. Karena di dalam tubuh kita itu ada yang namanya asam kuat dan ada yang namanya asam lemak. Asam lemak ini uh, yang kita gunakan dalam hal ini hanya dua ya. Uh, fosfat dan juga albumin. Nah, ini pasti saya yakin kedua unsur ini sangat akrab ya dalam uh, praktek sehari-hari kita. Oke, kita coba lihat satu-satu. Kita fokus uh, ke steward bahwa pH itu terutama di komponen metaboliknya dipengaruhi oleh strong ion difference dan satu lagi adalah uh, weak acid. Nah, kita coba lihat strong ion difference itu didapatkan dari mana. Strong ion different itu karena namanya strong ion different berarti perbedaan atau selisih ion-ion uh, kuat. Di dalam tubuh kita itu ada ion lemah dan ada ion kuat. Nah fokusnya di sini adalah ion kuat. Ion kuat itu paling banyak dalam tubuh kita itu adalah ada natrium, kalium, magnesium, ini kalsium, klorida, dan laktat. Tapi dari semua ini yang paling dominan dalam tubuh kita itu adalah natrium dan kalium, ya sehingga uh, magnesium, kalsium, klorida dan latat ini kadang-kadang tidak diperhitungkan karena ya memang paling besar porsinya, paling besar kadarnya itu adalah natrium dan kalium yang lain-lain ini tidak kita hitung secara rinci sehingga kadang-kadang yang lain-lain ini kita sebutnya dengan unreserved anion, anion yang tidak diukur atau kita abaikan. Karena memang uh, angkanya kecil-kecil ya. Nah, kemudian dari mana mendapatkan uh, dari mana mendapatkan SID? Ini SID adalah selisih antara seluruh ion yang bermuatan positif atau kita sebutnya dengan kation dikurangi dengan seluruh ion yang dia muatannya negatif atau kita istilahkan dengan anion. Nah, di dalam tubuh kita itu ada kesetimbangan ion. Kesetimbangan ion itu artinya antara kation dan anion, antara ion yang bermuatan positif dengan yang bermuatan negatif itu selisihnya selalu nol. Ya, selalu nol. Tubuh selalu mengupayakan itu dalam mencapai dalam mencapai uh, kesetimbangan nol itu, Na ini sifatnya statis, kation ini sifatnya statis. Yang akan terus berubah-ubah ini adalah pada komponen anion ini, gitu ya. Untuk bisa nol, ya untuk bisa nol selisihnya ini bagannya ini kan uh, harus sama tinggi ya antara kation dan anion. Kalau dia tinggi begini, ini kan hanya analogi ya, bagan analogi yang bisa kita lihat prediksinya apakah nanti selisihnya nol atau tidak. Kalau dia sama tinggi, maka dia akan nol. Nah, tubuh itu akan selalu mengupayakan ini antara kation dan anion itu eh, kadarnya sama, tinggi, sehingga nanti selisihnya nol. Nah, dalam upaya itu, tubuh itu entah akan menambah atau mengurangi kloridanya, menambah atau mengurangi weak acid-nya, atau dia menambah SID-nya atau mengurangi SID-nya. Dalam rangka anion ini harus selalu sejajar atau kadarnya sama dengan kation. SID normal itu adalah antara 38 sampai 42 mili ekvivalen per liter. Ya, mudah-mudahan bisa dipahami. Uh, sebuah ion itu disebut sebagai ion kuat ketika ion itu berdisosiasi sepenuhnya di dalam larutan. Berdisosiasi itu dia bisa terpecah. Misalnya NaCl gitu ya, Na dan Cl. Misalnya pada senyawa garam ya, uh, rumus kimianya kan Na dan Cl. Mengapa Na dan Cl itu masuk sebagai strong ion atau ion yang kuat? Karena kalau dia dimasukkan ke dalam air atau larutan, itu dia akan berdisosiasi atau terpisah secara sempurna. 
atau bahasa bahasa awamnya mungkin kalau kita melarutkan gula gitu ya gula ke dalam air ketika itu dia masuk ke dalam ke dalam air gitu ya misalnya kita ambil sesendok sesendok gula gitu ya dimasukkan ke dalam cangkir kita aduk-aduk <tuh> saat diaduk-aduk ketika gulanya itu larut tidak terlihat lagi objek gulanya di dalam larutan itu kita sebutnya itu terdosisiasi atau larut dengan sempurna ya sama dengan ini kalau ion itu masuk ke dalam cairan ya dan dia itu terpisah secara sempurna terlarut terpecah-pecah secara sempurna maka dia disebut sebagai strong ion strong ion ini uh, differentnya selisihnya antara 38 sampai 42 bagaimana strong ion different ini mempengaruhi pH kan gitu ya kenapa bisa mempengaruhi pH SID ini kalau dia turun maka kondisi atau suasana dalam tubuh itu akan cenderung mengalami asidosis dan kalau SID-nya meningkat akan membuat suasana tubuh kita itu cenderung mengalami alkalosis ya. Jadi kalau tadi ada normalnya 38, kita bisa lihat kalau SID-nya itu di bawah 38, maka bisa kita simpulkan pH-nya turun atau asidosis dan kalau dia di atas 42 bisa kita uh, interpretasikan pasien itu mengalami peningkatan pH atau terjadi kondisi alkalosis. Nah, tadi adalah strong ion difference. Satu lagi adalah asam lemah gitu ya, atau weak acid. Yang diperhitungkan di sini asam lemah sebetulnya ada beberapa ya, tapi yang kita perhitungkan di sini karena memang yang paling dominan berada dalam tubuh itu adalah albumin dan juga e, fosfat ya. Nah, kalau apa pengaruhnya e, terhadap e, pH pada tubuh kalau asam lemah ini meningkat, misalnya ya albumin. Kalau albumin ini meningkat, maka akan menyebabkan pasien itu mengalami asidosis. Begitupun dengan fosfat. Kalau fosfat itu hiper, hiperfosfat, maka akan menyebabkan asidosis. Begitupun dengan ini ya albumin dan fosfat kalau terjadi penurunan atau hipo hipoalbuminemi atau hipofosfatemi maka akan menyebabkan pH itu meningkat atau terjadi alkalosis. Nah kita coba kaitkan antara kation dan anion ini tingginya harus sama antara kation dan anion kadarnya harus sama. Nah ketika terjadi pelebaran dari weak acid terjadi peningkatan ini akan dia mempersempit ini ya HCl3 nya sehingga nanti akan mendorong untuk terjadi e, asidosis. Coba bayangkan kalau misalnya e, asam lemahnya ini menyempit, gitu ya, makin turun ke bawah, sehingga bagian SID di sini atau sepadan dengan HCl3 kan berarti makin lebar ya. Itu nanti akan mendorong suasana tubuh menjadi alkalosis. Nah ini mudah-mudahan bagian ini bisa lebih mencerminkan apa yang terjadi di dalam tubuh ya. Nah, normal itu seperti ini, ya bagian pertama ini normal, NAK ini adalah kation dan anionnya di sini adalah Cl yang paling dominan ya. Kemudian selebihnya itu ada HCO3 dan juga ada albumin dan juga fosfat atau asam asam lemah. Nah di dalam anion ini selain Cl kita tadi sudah bahas SID dan eh, ini ya asam lemah. Asam lemah di sini adalah albumin dan fosfat. Kondisinya harus seperti ini. Nah, kita coba lihat pada kondisi terjadi asidosis ketika albumin dan fosfat meningkat. Ya, ini, ini awalnya segini nih. Ya, nah, ini mudah-mudahan kursor-kursor yang saya gerakkan ini bisa terlihat oleh audiensnya. Albumin awalnya ini seperti ini, lalu kemudian pada kondisi asidosis albumin dan fosfat itu terjadi peningkatan, biasanya sehingga melebar gitu ya. Nah, ini akan membuat SID-nya menjadi menurun pasti kan? Nah, ini. Karena tadi ini ketinggian antara NaK dengan klorida ini mesti mesti sama ya. Jadi HCO3 ini akan menyempit sehingga SID turun. Nah, tadi efek kalau SID turun itu berarti mengarahkan kondisi tubuh itu mengalami asidosis. Nah, sebaliknya pada kondisi alkalosis ketika 
ketika albumin ini turun atau fosfatnya turun, ya, ini akan membuat SID menjadi semakin lebar. Tadi kita sudah jelaskan bahwa kalau kalau SID meningkat itu akan mengarah kondisi alkalosis karena kenapa pH-nya menjadi meningkat. Jadi kalau membayangkan ini, ini ini sebetulnya di satu slide ini jawabannya gitu ya. Kapan SID itu turun ketika albumin dan fosfat itu terjadi peningkatan. Dan kapan SID itu bisa meningkat ketika albumin dan fosfat itu turun. Nah, sementara SID turun itu akan mengarahkan ke kondisi asidosis dan SID meningkat itu akan mengarahkan ke kondisi alkalosis. Nah, kita coba lihat bagaimana cara mengklasifikasikan gangguan keseimbangan asam basa antara Henderson, Asoba, dengan Stewart. Karena tadi eh, komponen pada Henderson, Asoba itu hanya dua pada metabolik, ya. sehingga ini mempengaruhi juga cara menginterpretasinya. Kalau kita bandingkan antara Henderson, Asoba, dan Stewart, pasti ini semua sepakat ya kalau Henderson, Asoba itu lebih sederhana dibandingkan dengan Stewart. Gitu ya. Nah, Henderson Hasselba ini kenapa sederhana? Karena memang yang mempengaruhi uh, di respiratorik ini hanya CO2 saja, lalu kemudian pada metabolik ini hanya HCO3 saja. Ya, beda kalau di Stewart, kalau di asidosis respiratorik ini atau alkalosis respiratorik ini sama, ini betul-betul hanya ditentukan oleh CO2 saja. Gitu ya, tapi pada komponen metabolik. Nah, karena tadi metabolik ini dipengaruhi oleh SID, SID ini ditentukan oleh natrium dan klorida, gitu ya. Kemudian pada asam lemah ditentukan oleh albumin dan juga fosfat. Nah, inilah yang kemudian membuat klasifikasinya ini makin banyak. Tapi keuntungannya ini memang tampak sangat kompleks dan rumit ya, tapi eh, dengan kita melakukan pendekatan ini kita bisa mengetahui uh, secara lebih spesifik tindakan yang lebih dibutuhkan oleh pasien. Beda kalau misalnya di Henderson Nasselba, pada pasien yang mengalami asidosis metabolik itu, uh, ini uh, jawabannya selalu adalah pemberian bikarbonat. Jadi ya, beda kalau kita menggunakan pendekatan steward, kita itu akan lebih pasti mengetahui penyebab pasien mengalami asidosis metabolik itu apa misalnya. Pasien itu mengalami asidosis metabolik bukan karena dia kekurangan HCO3 ya, tapi kemungkinan bisa karena natriumnya turun sehingga pasien itu ketika dia diberikan infus NaCl maka asidosis metaboliknya itu bisa pulih. Bisa juga misalnya pasien itu e, mengalami asidosis metabolik akibat laktat. Ya, laktat ini kebanyakan terjadi misalnya pada kondisi shock. Sehingga pasien itu ketika dia diberikan uh, resusitasi cairan yang mencukupi, maka laktatnya menjadi berkurang produksinya, asidosisnya bisa menjadi pulih kembali. Gitu ya. Jadi uh, tidak selalu asidosis metabolik itu pemberian atau jawabannya atau solusinya adalah bikarbonat. Kalau dengan pendekatan steward ini, ada pasien-pasien itu yang asam basahnya bisa pulih kembali dengan kita memberikan cairan, ada yang bisa pulih kembali dengan memberikan asupan protein yang cukup, ya atau ada yang menjadi normal kembali asam basanya karena kita eh, kita me mengurangi laktat dan juga ketoasidosisnya. Ya. Nah kira-kira seperti ini kesimpulannya ya kalau di dibuat dalam satu slide, ya eh, untuk Kondisi alkalosis dan asidosis, kalau dari komponen respirasi, ini baik antara Henderson, Hasselba, dan Seward ini sama. Penentunya adalah PCO2. Ketika terjadi penurunan CO2, karena CO2 ini sifatnya asam, jadi kalau dia turun, berarti kan pasien itu akan cenderung mengalami bahasa. Ya. Sehingga dia uh, terjadi alkalosis hipokarbia. Kemudian kalau asidosis, uh, tentu, CO2 itu meningkat karena CO2 ini berkontribusi untuk membuat suasana tubuh menjadi asam karena CO2 sendiri itu ya bersifat asam ya sehingga disebut dengan kondisi asidosis hiperkarbia. Nah, tadi sudah di di apa? sudah diulas bahwa 
SID bahwa metabolik itu kalau menurut Hengger eh, steward itu ditentukan oleh dua komponen SID dan juga with acid. Nah bagaimana pada kondisi abnormal SID dan abnormal pada weak acid? Kita coba lihat pada abnormal SID. SID itu menjadi tidak normal pada kondisi misalnya natriumnya terlalu tinggi, gitu ya. Kalau natrium terlalu tinggi, nah ini akan membuat alkalosis, ya. Dan kalau natriumnya menjadi turun, maka akan membuat kondisinya mengalami asidosis. Kenapa kalau natriumnya itu natriumnya itu naik menjadi alkalosis dan kalau natrium turun itu menjadi asidosis? Nah ini coba dibayangkan gitu ya, SID-nya tadi. Kalau Na-nya ini meningkat, itu akan membuat SID makin menjadi lebar gitu ya sehingga dia akan mengarah ke alkalosis begitu pun sebaliknya. Nah, klorida ini juga sama, cuma ini berbeda muatan ya kalau natrium itu bermuatan positif, klorida ini bermuatan negatif. Pada kondisi kloridanya ini terlalu sedikit, maka akan menyebabkan pasien ini mengalami alkalosis dan kalau kloridanya ini meningkat, ini akan membuat pasiennya mengalami hiperkloremi. Nah, ini yang menjadi penjelasan mengapa pasien-pasien yang mengalami shock, butuh resistai cairan, lalu kita misalnya berikan resistairannya, cairannya itu adalah NaCl. Gitu ya. Berarti kan ada isinya Na dan Cl. Ketika Cl itu diberikan terlalu banyak dan menumpuk dalam tubuh terlalu banyak, ini akan membuat pasien itu mengalami asidosis. Ini juga yang menjadi alasan mengapa pada kondisi pasien yang shock itu Walaupun kristaloid itu boleh memilih antara NaCl atau cairan-cairan lain, maka dihindari menggunakan NaCl karena NaCl itu dia mengandung natrium yang cukup banyak dan klorida juga yang cukup banyak sehingga kalau itu diberikan ikan akan membuat kloridanya menjadi banyak sehingga akan mengarahkan pasien itu mengalami asidosis. Jadi lebih baik pilih selain NaCl itu misalnya rinjar laktat atau asering untuk pemberian. Uh, resusitasi cairan. Kemudian tadi selain Na dan Cl itu sebetulnya ada juga anion yang tidak diukur gitu ya karena dia jumlahnya sangat kecil. Apa saja itu? Ini ada dua, laktat dan juga keton gitu ya. Laktat dan juga keton ini dua-duanya bersifat asam sehingga kalau ada dalam tubuh ini akan membuat suasana tubuh menjadi asidosis. Pada weak acid ini hanya ada dua, albumin dan juga fosfat. Nah, contohnya misalnya pasien-pasien yang dia badannya bengkak gitu ya. Kemudian kita ukur ternyata ini bengkak badannya karena terjadi hipoalbumin ini. Jadi tekanan onkotiknya berkurang sehingga cairan-cairan di dalam pembuluh darah itu lepas semua ke interstisial sehingga menyebabkan pasien itu menjadi bengkak gitu ya. Ini terjadi umum terjadi pada pasien-pasien hipoalbumin ini. Nah inilah yang menjadi alasan kenapa pada pasien-pasien yang albuminnya itu turun akan cenderung mengalami alkalosis. Ya, ini kalau kita menggunakan pendekatan Anderson Hasselbaugh itu tidak ketahuan apa hubungannya albumin dengan pH pasien. Ya, tapi kalau kita menggunakan pendekatan Anderson Hasselbaugh, albumin, fosfat, laktat, keton itu semua itu itu mempengaruhi pH. Beda sekali dengan uh, Anderson Hasselbaugh yang menurut pendapatnya pH itu hanya ditentukan oleh kalau bukan CO2 ya CO3 ya tapi kalau menurut Stewart itu lebih kompleks gitu ya pH itu bisa dipengaruhi oleh kadar natrium, kadar klorida, kadar laktat, kadar keton, kadar albumin dan yang terakhir adalah kadar fosfat. Nah hubungan pH dengan SID ini ada dampaknya ya. Pada kondisi terjadi asidosis, pH di bawah 7,35, ini kan SID-nya turun ya. Itu terjadi pada kondisi apa? Pada kondisi hiponatremi. Ini bisa terjadi karena pasien itu diberikan cairan yang terlalu banyak. Ya. Atau yang kemudian kedua adalah hiperkloremi. Ini juga diberikan resusi cairan NaCl terlalu banyak sehingga terjadi penumpukan klorida dalam tubuh. Kemudian Uh, asidosis itu juga bisa terjadi pada ketoasidosis yang menyebabkan SID menjadi turun. 
Pada kondisi alkalosis, pH di atas 7,45 terjadi peningkatan SID. Kita bisa temukan pada pasien-pasien yang hipernatremi, hipokloremi. Ini yang terjadi, hipokloremi terjadi pada kondisi apa? Muntah, karena klorida banyak di asam lambung. ya. Sehingga kalau pasiennya itu muntah atau nasogastric suctioning eh, ter, dilakukan pengosongan lambung gitu ya. Eh, biasanya pada kondisi keracunan gitu dilakukan nasogastric suctioning dikeluarkan terus menerus uh, asam lambungnya ini akan menyebabkan kondisi hiperkloremi. Oke, okay. nah kesimpulan besarnya ada di slide ini perbedaan SID dan asam basa. Ini natrium ini sifatnya statis. Nah uh, kondisi anion inilah yang akan menyesuaikan supaya selalu sama dengan jumlah natrium dan kalium ini ya atau kation. Kalau kondisi normal seperti ini, dia akan menghasilkan SID sekitar 34. Pada kondisi terjadi hiperkloremi, ini juga bisa dibayangkan ya kalau kloridanya ini meningkat, ini kan akan menyusutkan SID. Kenapa? Karena space untuk SID menjadi makin sempit karena udah didesak oleh CL yang makin meningkat. Kondisi ini akan menyebabkan SID turun. Nah, tadi kuncinya SID turun itu akan menyebabkan pasiennya mengalami asidosis. Bagaimana kalau terjadi klorida turun? Klorida turun berarti ini akan memperluas area SID atau meningkatkan SID. Berarti nanti kesimpulannya terjadi alkalosis. Nah, bagaimana pada laktat dan keton gitu ya? Misalnya kita ibaratkan kloridanya ini normal 102 tapi terjadi kondisi laktat dan keton gitu ya. Laktat dan keton ini akan mempersempit SID karena mengambil space-nya SID sehingga kalau SID turun itu efeknya adalah asidosis ya. Kemudian fosfat misalnya fosfat ini jumlahnya sangat kecil gitu ya. Albumin dan fosfat jumlahnya sangat kecil ini berarti SID-nya akan melebar ya sehingga akan menyebabkan ini kondisinya adalah alkalosis. Sebaliknya, kalau albumin dan fosfatnya meningkat, ini akan memperkecil SID, ya kan? Sehingga ini akan menyebabkan kondisi pasiennya mengalami asidosis. Jadi kuncinya di sini adalah apapun perubahan yang terjadi, peningkatan CLK, penurunan CLK atau uh, peningkatan laktat K atau peningkatan keton K atau peningkatan atau penurunan albumin dan fosfat K yang harus dibayangkan ini adalah uh, semua peningkatan-peningkatan yang terjadi baik pada albumin, fosfat, laktat dan keton itu pasti dia akan mempersempit SID karena dia uh, ini ya dia kan akan mengisi gap gitu ya sehingga kalau terjadi peningkatan-peningkatan itu dia akan mempersempit SID begitu pun sebaliknya kalau kadar-kadar di -kadar uh, klorida kemudian keton, laktat, fosfat dan album itu turun pasti dia akan memperlebar SID. Kata kuncinya di sini adalah kalau SID meningkat atau melebar itu akan menyebabkan kondisi alkalosis. Jadi sebetulnya tidak perlu dihafal ya, tinggal membayangkan saja peningkatan kadar klorida, peningkatan kadar laktat, peningkatan kadar keton, peningkatan kadar album dan fosfat itu efeknya kemana? Meningkatkan mempersempit SID atau menurunkan SID. Meningkatkan SID itu berarti dia akan mengarah ke alkalosis dan kalau SID turun itu dia akan uh, dia akan menyebabkan terjadinya asidosis. <tuh> Ini karena tidak bisa interaktif, saya hanya akan menunjukkan simulasi kasusnya ya. Ada tiga kasus. Kalau waktunya cukup saya akan munculkan semua. Ini saya tinggal menunggu arahan dari moderator ini aja ya, mengingatkan waktu. Selama saya tidak diingatkan, berarti waktunya masih cukup ya. <laughs> Mohon maaf Pak, waktunya 5 menit lagi. Oh baik, yeah. uh, insya Allah cukup 5 menit. <tuh> baik, uh, kalau metode Henderson Asalba, saya yakin kita semua sudah tahu. ya. Ada tiga tahapan, yang pertama nilai pH-nya, kalau pH-nya naik, lebih dari normal berarti dia itu adalah kalosis kalau turun dia asidosis kemudian kita akan identifikasi penyebab utama gangguan pH-nya kalau menurut Anderson Asolba ini kan dua ya ada ada respiratorik dan ada metabolik ya nanti tinggal tinggal ketiga 
uh, yang kita lakukan adalah identifikasi apakah ada kompensasi atau tidak. Yes. Nah, uh, kuncinya di sini. Jadi kalau baca AGD, ingat ROM. ROM ini bahasa Inggris ya. Respiratory, oposite, metabolic itu equal. Jadi tentukan dulu pH-nya. pH-nya itu kalau turun berarti asidosis. Kalau pH-nya naik di atas 7,45 berarti itu alkalosis. Nah, selanjutnya kita harus tentukan apakah uh, pasien ini mengalami kondisi respirasi gangguan pH-nya itu apakah disebabkan oleh karena faktor respiratorik atau karena faktor metabolik. Nah, untuk mengetahui respiratorik atau metabolik, ini kita harus lihat arah perubahan pH-nya. Apakah berlawanan atau dia searah, ya. Kita akan menyimpulkan penyebab gangguan pH-nya itu adalah respiratorik kalau arah pH-nya itu berlawanan dengan PCO2. Jadi misalnya begini, kalau pH-nya naik, harusnya PCO2 itu turun. Begitupun sebaliknya, kalau pH turun, maka PCO2 harus naik. Arahannya kalau kita temukan pola begitu, berarti dia itu respiratorik. Nah bagaimana kalau metabolik? Metabolik itu arah perubahan pH ini selalu searah dengan HCO3. Jadi kalau kita menemukan pH-nya naik, HCO3 juga naik. Berarti dia itu bukan respiratorik, dia itu metabolik. Begitupun sebaliknya, kalau kita melihat pH-nya turun, kemudian HCO3-nya turun, berarti itu juga metabolik. Nah tinggal selanjutnya adalah apakah terjadi kompensasi atau tidak. Gitu ya Kalau pada asidosis yang dia kita bisa simpulkan itu misalnya respiratori maka kompensasinya kalau respiratorik karena dia itu respiratorik diwakili oleh CO2 maka kompensasinya adalah untuk menetralisir CO2 itu perlu ada HCO3 yang dihasilkan kalau terjadi peningkatan CO2 maka HCO3 juga harus dipicu gitu ya supaya terjadi kompensasi nah kalau kita lihat Uh, ada perubahan nilai PCO2 yang sudah disertai juga perubahan nilai HCO3 maka itu berarti sudah terjadi kompensasi ya. Nah, begitu pun sebaliknya, kalau terjadi perubahan HCO3 yang dia diikuti dengan perubahan PCO2 berarti itu dia sudah terjadi kompensasi. Nah, kompensasi di sini terbagi dua, ada kompensasi sebagian atau penuh atau disebutnya partially compensated dan ada fully compensated. Kompensasi penuh itu kalau pH kembali normal dan kalau sebagian itu pH sudah berubah tapi belum kembali ke kondisi rentang normal. Ya. Nah, bagaimana kalau metode Stewart? Metode Stewart ini sebetulnya tidak perlu dihafal-hafal ya. Nanti kalau terbiasa menggunakan ini itu akan secara secara apa? Secara seiring dengan pembiasaan yang dilakukan ini akan dihafal ya bahkan kadang-kadang tanpa harus dihitung-hitung begini tuh udah dapat menangkap pesannya ini dia penyebab dari ketidakseimbangan pH-nya itu apa langkah pertama dan kedua sama sama dengan yang di apa yang dipakai oleh Henderson Alba yang berbeda ini adalah kita akan menghitung apakah ada efek SID, apakah ada efek albumin, atau apakah ada efek anion anion. Ya. Nah, kita coba lihat langkah ketiga, nilai apakah ada efek SID. Di sini maksudnya di sini, apakah perubahan pH itu ada sumbangan atau kontribusi dari perubahan Na dan Cl. Ya. Nah, kalau kita hitung-hitung uh, ini semua ini ya, ini Uh, efek SID, efek albumin, efek admission anion kalau kita hitung-hitung pakai rumus ini semuanya harus menghasilkan angka 0. Ya. Kalau angkanya 0 berarti misalnya ya, efek SID-nya ini 0 berarti perubahan pH-nya itu bukan disebabkan karena Na dan Cl. Atau misalnya pada nilai adanya efek albumin. Ini kalau kita dapat angkanya nanti 0 maka penyebab perubahan pH pada pasien itu bukan karena perubahan kadar albuminnya, karena faktor lain. Ya. Kemudian yang kelima kita nilai apakah ada efek anion. Anion 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 tadi di sini adalah uh, laktat dan juga keton ya. Jadi misalnya kalau di, kalau ini hasilnya nol berarti 
perubahan pH-nya itu bukan karena laktat, bukan karena keton, tapi karena yang lain. Ya, jadi targetnya di sini semua rumus-rumus ini 3, 4, dan 5 ini nanti targetnya harus mendapatkan angka 0 untuk menyingkirkan kemungkinan misalnya kalau SID-nya itu 0 berarti perubahan pH-nya itu bukan karena Na dan Cl-nya atau kalau efek albuminnya itu nanti dapat nilai 0 berarti bukan karena perubahan albuminnya dan terakhir kalau anisot anion itu hasilnya 0 maka bukan karena efek laktat dan juga dari keton. Ini mudah-mudahan bisa dipahami ya. Jadi menghitung-hitung di sini targetnya harus dapat angka 0. Atau begini, kalaupun tidak dapatkan angka 0, maka hasilnya itu masih dalam rentang plus minus 0,5. Jadi itu masih bisa ditoleransi. Jadi kalaupun bukan 0 hasilnya, tapi masih dalam rentang min 0,5 sampai 0,5 itu masih dianggap 0. Ya, masih dianggap uh, tidak ada efek atau tidak ada pengaruh. Baik. Nah, saya coba aplikasikan kasus pertama ya. Seorang laki-laki ini usianya 36 tahun diantar ke IGD, keluhannya mual dan buta, badannya terasa lemas, mata dan kulit tampak menguning. Pasien telah dilakukan resusitasi cairan NaCl. Didapatkan hasil pemeriksaannya pH-nya 7,25, PCO 2 nya 30 mm Hg, HCO 3 nya 14 mili ekipalen per liter, BA-nya min 10, NA-nya 140, CL-nya ini 112, kemudian albuminnya ini 4,0 gram per desiliter. Ya. Baik. Nah, kita coba simulasikan eh, dengan metode Henderson asal bah. Kalau saya eh, menghitung atau menginterpretasi dengan menggunakan metode Anderson Hasselbaugh itu saya membuat tanda panah ke atas atau tanda panah ke bawah. Ya. Contohnya begini, pH-nya 7,25 berarti ini ke bawah atau ke atas ini ke bawah ya, karena normalnya pH kan 7,35 ya sampai 7,45 berarti kalau 7,25 berarti kan dia arahnya ke bawah ya. Nah kemudian PCO2 itu Normalnya kan 35 sampai 45, berarti kalau 30 turun. Nah ini kalau dia searah begini, ini tidak mungkin penyebab gangguan pH-nya itu adalah respirasi. Karena kalau respirasi itu harus harus ini ya berlawanan arahnya. Nah kemungkinan karena ini bukan respirasi, kemungkinan ini adalah metabolik. Kita coba lihat. Apakah arah perubahan pH itu searah dengan arah perubahan pH CO3? Nah, ini CO3 nya turun ya. Kenapa? Karena normalnya CO3 itu kan 022 sampai 26. Jadi kalau 14 turun. Nah, dengan melihat arah-arah perubahannya, jadi ini adalah metabolik karena pH itu searah dengan arah perubahan CO3. Nah, karena dia ini turun berarti asidosis. Jadi kalau dibaca hasil analisisnya adalah asidosis metabolik ya terkompensasi sebagian. Kenapa terkompensasi sebagian? Karena kalau belum terkompensasi harusnya PCO2-nya ini kadarnya normal. Tapi karena PCO2 ini juga sudah terpengaruh artinya tubuh itu sudah mulai mengkompensasi diri, menetralisir kadar pH dengan cara apa supaya mengimbangi ACO3 yang terus turun, dia harus tubuh itu harus mengimbangi dengan melakukan penurunan PCO2 juga supaya apa? Tidak selalu penurunannya itu tidak terus menerus turun pH-nya gitu ya karena pH karena PCO2 itu kan sifatnya asam sementara pH itu kalau turun kan juga asam ya berarti CO2 itu tidak boleh tinggi kadarnya dia harus turun supaya supaya bisa kembali pH-nya ke kondisi normal nah karena ini juga PCO2-nya sudah terpengaruh berarti dia terkompensasi mengapa sebagian karena pH-nya ini belum kembali normal Oke, ini Uh, itu pendekatan dengan Henderson Hasselbaugh. Bagaimana dengan metode Stewart? Metode Stewart ini karena dia ada rumus-rumusnya ya. Kita coba lihat ya. pH-nya ini asidosis karena dia turun ya. Kemudian PCO2-nya ini hipokardia karena dia turun. Normalnya kan 35 sampai 45 ya PCO2-nya itu ya. Nah kita coba uh, hitung apakah uh, Penurunan pH-nya itu disebabkan oleh karena SID. SID dalam hal ini adalah Na atau Cl. Kita coba hitung ya. 
Na-nya 140 dikurang Cl-nya itu adalah 112. Kemudian ini dikurang 38. 38 ini sudah konstanta ya. Di, di, dimasukkan ke dalam rumusnya, saya dapat angka min 10. Berarti min 10 ini kan harusnya 0 atau antara min 0,5 sampai 0,5 ya. Berarti pasien ini mengalami penurunan pH disebabkan karena adanya faktor dari SID. SID ini berarti di sini kalau bukan Na ya Cl gitu ya. Cuma kita juga belum tahu ini antara Na atau Cl apakah Na-nya atau Cl-nya yang membuat pasien ini mengalami asidosis. Nah, sebelum menyimpulkan kita lanjut dulu ke albumin. Albumin ini rumusnya 0,25 kali 42. Nah, tadi kan kadar albuminnya itu 4 ya. Kenapa jadi 40? Nah, ini berbeda berbeda apa? Uh, berbeda satuan ya kalau satuan normalnya kan uh, miligram per desiliter ya sementara di sini adalah gram per liter sehingga kalau diubah jadinya awalnya 4 ini kita kali dengan 10 supaya uh, supaya bisa masuk ke dalam rumus ini jadi jangan lupa sebelum albumin itu dihitung albuminnya dikali 10 dulu ya supaya yang awalnya 4 ini jadi 40 Nah, saya hitung, ini dapatnya angka 0,2, 0,5. 0,5 ini tidak 0, tapi masih dalam rentang min 0,5 sampai 0,5. Ini berarti dianggap tidak ada efek ya, atau ini bisa dinolkan. Ya. Nah, kemudian selanjutnya di efek unmeasure anion, tadi didapatkan SBE-nya itu min 10. Ini didapatkan dari hasil lab ya, SBE ini. Kemudian masukkan hasil dari efek NaCl min 10 kemudian efek albumin 0,5 hasilnya ini min 0,5 ini berarti ini bisa dianggap tidak ada efek atau 0 karena masih dalam rentang min 0,5 sampai 0,5 nah dari dari sini kita bisa menyimpulkan pasien ini mengalami penurunan pH karena efek dari SID-nya atau efek dari NaCl-nya bukan dari efek albuminnya atau bukan dari efek Anmisal anion, anmisal anion ini laktat atau e, keton, ya. Nah, <tuh> tapi dengan rumus ini sebetulnya belum bisa juga kita menentukan apakah Na-nya atau Cl-nya sehingga ini tetap kita harus bisa tahu kadar normal Na dan kadar normal Cl itu berapa. Nah, kalau kita lihat dari sini e, Na-nya 140, kita tahu kadar normal Na itu adalah 135, 145 berarti efek jadi uh, pasiennya ini mengalami asidosis bukan karena Na-nya, karena Na-nya masih, masih normal. Cl-nya, nah ini terjadi peningkatan ya, karena Cl normal itu di kisaran 100 sampai 109. Gitu ya. Sehingga kita bisa mengambil kesimpulan pasien ini uh, ada efek SID-nya utamanya di Cl-nya, bukan di Na-nya. Lalu kalau di efek albumnya tidak ada efek, kemudian di UA-nya tidak ada efek UA. Kalau kita baca hasil analisisnya, pasien ini mengalami asidosis metabolik akibat hiperkloremi. Ya. Terus kalau kita sudah tahu seperti ini, maka berhati-hati pasien itu diberikan cairan yang ada kadar kloridanya. Gitu ya. Misalnya pasien itu saat itu terpasang NaCl, berarti jangan diteruskan pemberian NaCl-nya ganti cairan lain yang dia eh, kadar kloridanya lebih rendah misalnya pakai eh, asering atau dia pakai rinjar lakta gitu ya tetap ada kloridanya tapi kloridanya kadarnya lebih rendah dibandingkan dengan eh, N, cairan NAC ini contoh pertama ya. masih ada waktu kah kalau ada waktu saya kasus dua kalau tidak berarti kita lanjut ke tanya jawab langsung iya mohon maaf pak karena waktunya terbatas ya Iya, nanti Oke, langsung nanti untuk diskusi cukupkan. saja ya Pak. Ya. Ya, siap. Uh, setidaknya bayangannya seperti itu ya. Uh, saya uh, stop share, kita ke tanya jawab jika ada yang perlu diskusi. Terima kasih. Ya, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Di sini ada pertanyaan dari Dr. Ahmad Fatoni Pak. Mekanisme kompensasi asam basa 1, pernapasan 2, sistem buffer 3 ginjal. Mohon penjelasan kompensasi dengan sistem buffer dan bagaimanakah cara intervensi kita untuk sistem buffer tersebut. Oke, okay. 
Uh, terima kasih banyak. Baik, uh, ini pertanyaannya sangat baik dari Pak Dokter Fatomi ya. Ini senior saya juga sebenarnya ya. <laughs> baik, uh, Kak, kalau istilah buffer ginjal dan buffer apa buffer uh, paru ini berarti ini penjelasannya menggunakan pendekatan Henderson Nasrba atau metode tradisional karena yang mengenalkan teori buffer ini adalah Henderson Asalba. Jadi tubuh itu penentu pH-nya adalah dua organ utama. Respiratorik itu dikendalikan oleh paru dan untuk metabolik itu dikendalikan oleh paru ginjal. Gitu ya. <tuh> Bagaimana sistem buffer terjadi? Jika terjadi perubahan pada salah satunya, maka organ lainnya juga ini akan bertindak untuk mengalami perubahan. Misalnya pada pada paru dia dia memproduksi CO2 yang tinggi ya yang dia itu akan mengarahkan tubuh mengalami asidosis. Nah ini eh, maka organ satu lagi metabolik ginjal itu akan berfungsi sebagai buffer untuk membuat kondisi neutralisiti atau kesetaraan ya sehingga eh, oleh oleh ginjal itu dia akan melakukan apa supaya pH-nya menjadi normal. Dia akan membuat kondisi supaya has, supaya PCO2 itu ternetralisir, dia itu ginjal karena dia itu memproduksi HCO3 yang kadarnya kadarnya basah maka harus diimbangi juga dengan peningkatan HCO3 gitu ya supaya Uh, nanti pH-nya itu menjadi normal kenapa? Karena CO2 yang tinggi itu akan dinetralisir dengan HCO3 yang uh, diproduksi yang sifatnya basah. Begitupun sebaliknya. Kalau misalnya uh, masalah utamanya adalah di metabolik terjadi peningkatan HCO3 yang tinggi, maka ini akan dibuffer, diimbangi oleh uh, organ paru dengan cara meningkatkan CO2 yang juga tinggi supaya nanti antara asam dan basa ini akan berimbang. Ya, ini yang kita sebut dengan sistem buffer. Nah, kalau untuk memikirkan intervensinya, ini memang kalau melakukan pendekatan Henderson Asolba ini sangat terbatas ya intervensi yang bisa kita lakukan. Kalau untuk e, mengoptimalkan buffer pada pada paru, maka intervensi yang paling bisa kita lakukan adalah e, pertama kalau yang e, Mandiri itu adalah memberikan reposisi yang uh, posisi itu akan menunjang terjadinya peningkatan ekspansi paru, misalnya posisi semipolar, gitu ya. Nah itu dia akan meningkatkan asupan oksigen yang banyak, lalu kemudian kita bisa tambahkan suplementasi oksigen. Ini nanti ini untuk meningkatkan optimalisasi uh, sistem buffer uh, yang dilakukan oleh paru. Kalau untuk HCO3, nah ini kalau menggunakan pendekatan Henderson Hasselba memang jawabannya hanya satu pemberian bikarbonat saja jawabannya. Gitu ya. Tidak banyak variasinya. Beda kalau kita menggunakan pendekatan Stewart, pH itu bisa kita normalkan dengan mengkoreksi natriumnya, mengkoreksi kloridanya, kemudian bisa mengkoreksi albuminnya, fosfatnya latatnya dan juga uh, apa uh, ketonnya ya ba banyak alternatifnya kalau kita menggunakan stiwa uh, mungkin seperti itu yang bisa di, di uh, sampaikan tanggapannya uh, ya, mudah-mudahan menjawab ya dan kalau tidak menjawab uh, mohon ma dimaafkan lebih dan kurang ya Iya <laughs> baik terima kasih Pak Adam telah menjawab pertanyaan dari Bapak dari Dr Ahmad Fatoni. Ya silakan rekan-rekan uh, yang ingin bertanya bisa dituliskan di kolom Q&A mengenai uh, materi yang disampaikan oleh Bapak Muhammad Adam mengenai interpretation blood gas analysis Henderson and Stewart method. Ya silakan rekan-rekan kepada rekan-rekan yang ingin bertanya bisa menuliskan di kolom Q&A-nya. <tuh> ya, sepertinya belum ada yang bertanya lagi ya Pak ya. Di sini uh, hanya Bapak Dr. Ahmad Fatoni saja. Baik, karena waktu juga yang uh, terbatas Pak ya. 
Iya, ya. saya mohon maaf untuk pertanyaan saya close saja dan mohon untuk Bapak Adam memberikan closing statementnya Pak Oke. sebelum kita ya. mengakhiri acara. Ya. Uh, baik, uh, terima kasih. Uh, sebagai closing statement, uh, mungkin saya hanya ingin berpesan ke diri saya dan juga rekan-rekan sekalian bahwa uh, alasan profesi ini ada adalah untuk pemenuhan kebutuhan. Ya. Di dalam pemenuhan kebutuhan ini, uh, ada banyak hal yang bisa kita lakukan, ya, uh, terutama pada kondisi mengancam jiwa untuk bisa mengurangi penderitaan yang dialami oleh pasien sangat tergantung dari kemampuan kita mengenali masalah apa sih yang dialami oleh pasien kita. Dan salah satunya dengan mengenali gangguan pasien dari aspek eh, kadar asam basa ini akan memperbesar kontribusi kita untuk mengurangi penderitaan yang dialami oleh pasien. Dengan metode henderson Hasselba, eh, solusi yang di, kita dapatkan pilihannya itu terbatas karena hanya berputar di CO3 dan CO2 saja. Tapi kalau kemudian kita bisa membekali diri kita dengan kemampuan menginterpretasi asam basa dengan pendekatan steward, ini akan membuat kita itu lebih punya banyak pilihan untuk bisa mengurangi penderitaan pasien. Terasa demikian. Uh, mohon maaf atas segala keterbatasan, terutama keterbatasan waktu dan juga keterbatasan saya dalam menyampaikan materi dengan baik. Dan yang ketiga ini keterbatasan interaksi ya, karena jadinya komunikasi kita one way, tidak two way. Iya, <tuh> yeah, betul sekali Pak Adam. Terima kasih banyak kepada Bapak Adam karena sudah memberikan materi dan menjawab pertanyaan dengan sangat baik. Terima kasih kepada Bapak Adam dan kita bisa bertemu lain waktu ya Pak ya. Baik, terima ya, kasih ya. banyak Pak Adam. Ya, sehat selalu, ya, salam ya. sehat. Salam untuk keluarga Bapak. Ya, Tuhan yang sama, salam sehat. Ya, baik. undur diri. Baik, Pak, silakan. Yes, well, alhamdulillahirabbil alamin. We've complete one by one activities for today from this special event. I hope new new, new knowledge are from three speakers adding insight for us in daily or in hospitals activities speakers are very ordinary in presented the subjects and gave us knowledge update about nursing thank you so much for dr abdul ali raja muhammad thank you so much for mr jonathan james ibanez quirao rncnn thank you so much for Mr. Nes Muhammad Adam MKP SPKMB for the uh, delivered material and I'm one of committee of this event to ask apology if we have some mistakes in everything. Perfection is belongs to God, mistake is belongs to me. Finally, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Safe, healthy, and take care. See you for tomorrow. Kita akan lanjut uh, event kita pada besok hari dimulai da, tepat pada pukul 8 waktu Indonesia bagian Barat. Baik, saya perwakilan dari komite mengucapkan terima kasih untuk event kita pada hari ini. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat siang, salam sehat, salam sejahtera untuk kita semua.
segalanya bagiku di antara berjuta di sana kau saja belahan jiwa ini tak